Okay. Eric, I'm going to mute you, so if you need to jump yeah, in. Well, I'm going to mute you until I introduce you. Okay. okay. All right, here we go. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this very special episode of addressing gettysburg's ask a gettysburg guide it's ask a gettysburg actor and uh before we get to our guest i'd like to introduce a guest co-host who's been on the show twice before so now this is his third time bo brinkman hello bo hey matt (laughs) (laughs) um bo has uh is uh very instrumental in getting the guests that we have today on the show and so uh we thought it would be fun if he was also the co-host since they have a shared experience and uh thank you bo for uh for setting this up for us or helping me set this up i should say absolutely uh okay so my guest today is someone you all know but let's pretend for a moment you don't and pretend you didn't read the title of the episode before you hit play And let's see if you can guess who I'm talking about. He was born Thomas Michael Moore. He studied journalism at the University of Missouri. He was a a flight attendant for Eastern Airlines. Uh, He worked uh, in television as Tim Siegel on One Life to Live, where he had a 66-episode run. He began appearing in films in 1977 with The Sentinel and continued on from there with Looking for Mr. Goodbar, The Dogs of War, The Big Chill, Eddie and the Cruisers, Betrayed, Major League, The Field, Gettysburg, Sliver, Sniper, The Substitute, and Occasional Hell with Bo. Bo, you were in that. Uh, One Man's Hero, Training Day, and Inception, among a gazillion others. His uh, television work includes One Life to Live, Johnny We Hardly Knew Ye, If Tomorrow Comes, Cheers, Rough Riders, Law and Order, Ally McBeal, Into the West, and that's really just scratching the surface. He's won many awards. He's won a Golden Globe for his Best Supporting Actor uh, performance in Platoon. He won the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Guest Actor in a Comedy Series for Cheers and Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Miniseries or a Movie for his performance as Jim Vance in the 2012 miniseries Hatfield and McCoys, the Golden Boot Award, the Lone Star Film and Television Award, so many other things. He was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for his portrayal as uh, Staff Sergeant Barnes in Platoon. The list goes on, ladies and gentlemen. Members of this audience know him best as General James Longstreet in Gettysburg, Teddy Roosevelt in the Rough Riders, and Jake Taylor in Major League. But perhaps, perhaps his crowning achievement of his career and the most pivotal role ever played is being a guest on Addressing Gettysburg. So please welcome the outstanding (laughs) Tom Berenger to the show. Oh, thank you! Ooh. Wow, I, uh, Tom, yeah. I've known you for thirty years, and I didn't know all this until right now about it's you. It's been a, a long, I guess, a long life. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, it uh, it it seems like an interesting life too. Um, where did it start? What well, I mean, acting? No, your life. My life. Oh, um, uh, Southside Chicago. Southside Chicago. Uh, what'd your parents do? Uh, my dad was a printer. My mom had been a bookkeeper and then became a housewife. Okay. And you grew up uh, south side of Chicago. Uh, you always wanted to be an actor, or how did you get into that? Um, no. Um, originally, I wanted to go into the military, but that didn't happen. Um, I was hoping to go to West Point. I'd been there when I was like six or seven, and I thought, wow, I'd like to come here. <clears throat> However, that didn't happen. Uh, two other guys in my school got commissions, which is kind of odd, you know, mm-hmm. and, and the odds of that are, are very, slim. you know, very low, but uh, yeah, slim. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, yeah, two other guys went and I went, oh, hell with that. You know, I thought I would go into journalism and specifically sports journalism, but that oh. didn't quite happen either. So, you know, uh, I was a journalism major as well. I was surprised to hear that you were. Um, well, you know, I think part of that was, uh, my dad being a printer oh. and he'd been a printer for the Chicago sometimes. And, and I remember sometimes going with him, uh, you know, either downtown there oh. sometimes or the, the Tribune or like that and seeing the printing presses and so on and so forth. I remember him telling me, see, the thing was, was that. You know, although being a printer is a blue-collar job, it's mm. like his spelling was perfect, 
um, he would correct the spelling of reporters, huh. <laughs> and his uh, grammar was great. His vocabulary was huge, and his because um, he read a lot as well. But um, kind of self-taught guy. But but just being a printer, I, and I imagine all of them. I mean, in those days, anyway, the line type operators and stuff that they they were doing the same thing, correcting the bad spelling of the reporters and. Huh. And you go, really? Yeah. Well, you know, like Hemingway was a great speller and perfect punctuation. You almost didn't have to edit him. He could edit himself. Mm. But but F. Scott Fitzgerald was terrible at spelling. <laughs> <Just>. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, so a Max lot of Perkins great, had I... the con- Max Perkins and those guys had at Scribners and Sons had to like constantly keep an eye on his punctuation and, and spelling and things. I, I, I've read that a lot of really great writers were bad spellers. Yeah, I mean, um, English is not an easy language. No, um, I, I've studied Latin, Spanish, and Italian, and I kind of know, you know, a little French because of it's a Latin uh-huh. language. But and Portuguese, at six months I was learning it. Wow. But I, you know, their rules are more strict, and English is a, a hobnob collection of, mm. of, of Latin of. Um, um, German, Anglo, Anglo-Saxon, and whatever, what uh, Celtic and mm-hmm. and uh, or Gaelic, and then Gaelic. Um, and then Viking, the Viking language, and 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 then the French invaded in from Normandy, um, mm-hmm. and I, you know, so I, and we just grab words right and left from you know, like rodeo was Spanish, patio was Spanish, mm-hmm. uh, umbrellas Italian, um. Wow, you know, and we just grab words and use them, and uh, ho- hopefully you spell them right. But it's it's hard for people that, like not only not only foreigners, but uh, our kids to learn correct spelling. Yeah, yeah. We also make uh, words that were intended to be nouns into verbs, or vice versa, and you know, it's it's a weird mm-hmm. way of speaking. I guess that would be more Americanism than English, or well, whatever. Uh, so, how did you how did you make that leap into acting, though? Um, I think it was my second year at college and, uh, it was like, uh, I was like maybe mm, seven o'clock at night or something like that. And I'm sitting on the, in my bunk there and my roommate, um, over on his side. And I hear this ad on the radio and I said, I think I'm going to try out for that. And he said, why? You're not an actor. I go, I know, but I'm just kind of bored. I'm not playing sports anymore. I don't have any extracurricular activities. It's just go to class, study, come home, you know, study, go to class. You know, I said, I, I don't know. I, mean, I think I'll try that. Well, I got the part. <laughs> and it was, a, it, it was a great play. It was four, uh, four characters only, and it was four hours long. And, and wow. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Oh, wow. Oh, play. wow. Yeah. And, so, and you, you know, played- I had it. Of Had course. it been like she stoops to conquer or something else, maybe yeah. Uh, no, I would have lost interest. Yeah. So, uh, what was what your character? what was your sport? You said you, you wait, had a in Virginia Wolf. Yeah. No. No. Wait. Hold on. I just want to go back oh, before oh, we go okay. too far away. Okay. You said you said that you don't play sports anymore. You didn't play sports anymore. What was your sport that you played? Well, I played football, baseball, basketball up to a point. Um, I messed around with boxing. Uh, just to stay in shape in the winter time. Um, I would box with the wrestlers, like the, the wrestling coach would say, hey, get over here. Uh, okay, fine. Oh, you know, and uh, well, there was only one guy that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> the others might have been great wrestlers, but they weren't, you know, good box. boxing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, you know, I, I, I've always been a swimmer, like do laps and things like that. Still do that. Okay. So that's why I couldn't ever keep up with you. Uh, we'd, uh, you know, have a, a couple of drinks and a couple of cigarettes and it, uh, the next morning, you know, he's he, jogging he, he, and you'd run just... five miles <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I'd be, you know, at your house, you know, when you're kind of yeah. getting in shape for something and I, I would, you almost killed me. <laughs> And I'm younger well, than I, you. I bet, I, bet <laughs> had, I bet you had to quit the smoking. You know, that, yeah. that, that, that day we, was going to come. It catches up yeah. to you at one point or another. Yeah. So, okay, now to Bo's question, what was the character that you played in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? The obvious it was one. Nick. Nick. The Nick, the younger. Yeah, the younger professor. Okay. Mm. Mm. 
um, and and, uh, and how did you like it? I mean, that, so you you weren't you had no designs on getting into acting, and it, it, here well, you go. No, well, you know what happened was like we 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 had sold out audiences, you know, in the theater, and and kind of standing room only, um, and we the the reaction. Remember, like we went out to take curtain call, and when the four of us walked out there, and it was dead silence in a full house. And we did a bow and we stood up and it was still dead silence. And we all looked at each other like, what? What the hell? Oh my God. <laughs> but, you know, what the hell is going on? And then finally, clappers, I mean, uh, clapping started and then. They stood to their feet. Huh. So they were just, just stunned awe. by yeah. the end of the of the play. Yeah, I, I remember. Were, no, I remember yeah. that, ha and that happened a couple times. But I remember the, um, and, and then also the thing I remember was that you know they're let's see four hours long. All right, so the first act is an hour and a half, and then they'd have a, a break, and then it would be, I guess, another hour or something. And then and then there would be a break, and that until the end of the play. So there were actually two breaks for the audience. Hmm. And they, they, I mean, most of them didn't even leave their seats, uh, uh, like uh -huh. to go out or use the bathroom or have a, a cocktail or something. They didn't do it. They just, they just sat there like, like they were afraid to leave the theater. Uh. Um, yeah, they didn't even get up, stretch their legs or anything. I, I, they were just glued to their seats. And I got, it's a pretty well-written play and he had in his, um, royalty, uh, contracts, um, that nothing could be cut from it. Mm. That's Edward Albee. That's his yeah. only play like that. Yeah. That not a single word could be cut. So it's like, um, was yeah, he, I mean, was he in the audience? Did he, did he give notes? No, no. You mm -hmm. never met him? No, okay. but it was, it was full speed and, you know, full, uh, I mean, we, we would like, you get laughs in there and you have to stop for the audience, but you, you jump right in as you feel the crescendo coming down. That's mm -hmm. the normal procedure. Um, before the applause ends, you start beginning as it begins to dim a bit and the audience can hear your voice over whatever laughter's left as you get on to the next beat. But, um, so we kept it tight as hell and the stage managers are always doing that in the theater. Sure. They, they always like checking. You know, they stop watching. Doesn't matter how long the play runs, you know, um, for years or travels or anything like that. They're always looking at that watch, making sure you keep it tight. Um, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, just hang on one second, Tom. I just want to uh, check something here on a technical level because I was just uh, <laughs> we did a we did a whole two. We did a whole two-hour show one time, and then it was finished, and the recording, there was some kind of problem with it, and it sounded like we were all robots. And so oh. I just wanted to make sure that wasn't happening now. Oh. <laughs> you know, so I you forgot. I, I usually do a test beforehand, but I didn't do that so today. So it's good. So it's yeah. good. Everything's fine. Okay. So we're all set now. Uh, so, so after you, after that show, cause usually something happens to you uh, as an actor, uh, and it's a lot of times it's that decision that moment that, where you decide to be an actor or not where you catch the bug yeah like that yeah. that that was it and you know and 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 i say my first play however um my first play actually was in spanish um it was <laughs> what was it like in the advanced Spanish class? Oh, oh. And, and he said, okay, everybody, now our next project here, you know, amongst yeah, many yeah, we yeah. have, because we were all in the advanced class. And out of that, we got, uh, you know, we were, I mean, I would have to say, I think every single one of us were, were A students in that, in that class. But um, out of that, we got um, an extra year equivalency in Spanish. So when we went to, to college, we didn't have to take Spanish one and Spanish two or something mm. like that. We jumped right ahead to a three hour course instead of the five hour courses with labs and all that kind of thing. So we, you know, we were able to, you know, yeah. bypass that. Sure. Um, 
and and we had to, I mean we had talked in Spanish all the time we were in class. Uh, we had to get up and, and do speeches and we been you know like book reports and things of that nature. Um, and then he would lecture in Spanish. Mm. So anyway, he tells us that we're going to do a play by a famous uh, Spanish playwright, Federico Garcia Lorca, who was actually lined up and shot down during the Spanish Civil War um, in the 30s. But anyway, and it was called Bodas de Sangre, which, which means uh, blood weddings. And um, uh, so we, re- we had to do the play, and I went up and I said, you know, Professor, I can't do this. No, no, my point about that. Um, he says, "Well, so Mas, you're going to have to because everybody in this class must do it." I go, "But I'm not an actor. I'm a football player." He goes, "I know, but you're going to have to do it." I go, "Well, oh, jeez, oh my God, what? What is the audience going to be?" He goes, "Mostly Hispanic, unless you want your parents to come." I go, "No, I don't want them to come." <laughs> he said, "Well, uh, well, yeah." And I go, so if we make a mistake, they're going to know. See, <laughs> <laughs> they're going to know. I'm afraid so, Tomas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my god! I was just, it was, I was just horrified at the thought, and and I and I was a wreck leading up to going on the stage. You know, we had to do, it, I guess, a couple nights, and it was it. And I was like, oh, my god, I can't do that. <laughs> So did that plant the seed in your head later no, when you decided? No, 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 no. It wasn't until I did Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Yeah. Okay, so that's where you got it. And then how did you yeah. parlay that into f- television and film? Well, how long did that take? Well, I, I went to New York. Um, I did, I did. you know, another player. T- wait, me, another wait, player wait, there you did the, a couple of more plays in college, right? At college. And, yes. And then, and then I was like, I remember I was working as a 60 millimeter film editor in Kansas City, and I did about three plays there, and then oh, somewhere else in the, in the Midwest. And then I went to New York, and I went to acting school down in the village, and I uh, started auditioning, and I, you know, got parts and plays, and yeah, you know, yeah. did you got the Playhouse yeah. on on Bank Street? No, I was on Bank Street, but it was uh, HB Studio. Oh, 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 HB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yep. I know where yep. it is. Yep. Sandy yep. Meisner's uh, group, right? Was that Sandy? No, you no. You started it? No, they were the... The Neighborhood Playhouse. The neighborhood Playhouse. That's right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. what was what was the, uh, the first uh, film role that you got, and how did you get it? Uh, or, or did you start in TV first? You started in TV well, first. Well, it was... Yeah, but yes, but um, and and I did that for a year, and then while I was doing it, I did about three off off Broadway plays, and, and um, so you know, I had to rehearse at night. I do that during the day, rehearse at night. Boy, I was exhausted because I was working every day. Wow. You know, yeah, every day, <clears throat> including you know a matinee night show on Saturday and a, and a matinee on Sunday. And then doing the TV show, and then doing the uh, and then doing the play at night, and re- or rehearsal and all that leading up to it. Whoa, I was burnt, but thank God I was young. Yeah. Is it seems like a, a lot of people got their start on soap operas? Was that like a thing, or is that still a thing? No, I don't. I, I don't, don't know. think so. Uh, I mean, I think it's so easy to get hooked into. I have so many friends that do soaps, and they've never been able to make that jump. Uh-huh. Uh, ever. No, and some stay even, there for not, sure. Not even to prime time. I mean, they're, yeah. boom, they're just there. Right. I think it's very few people that can actually do it. Meg Ryan did it. Uh, Tom obviously did. Oh, and you were, for how long were you uh, on that soap, Tom? I had a year a year contract. Oh, okay. So that's not so bad. But Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then, and then what do you go to after that? And like, Well, I did it. I, they, <clears throat> Richard Brooks, the writer director mm-hmm. came into town and he was doing, um, 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 looking for Mr. Goodbar. And he didn't want anybody to see the script. Why? I don't know because the book was a bestseller and the book was based on a real life case, mm-hmm. murder case in New York. Um, and so I, I, I went in and, and I, well, I told the casting lady, I said, 
Uh, well, I got this, this is play by Lyle Kessel called The Watering Place. She goes, I know it. I know it. And I know Lyle, too. I went, oh. yeah, great guy. I go, but anyway, I said, you know, I, I, I think I just use that. Use that one scene where the guy comes back from the Korean War and he goes to see his buddy's widow, and it just has this bizarre, freaky ending to it. Um, and I just used that one scene, and they said, and she said, "That's a great idea." But see where you're going with that. That's a great idea. You know, at least it kind of goes into that dark territory there uh, between a man and a woman. I go, mm-hmm. "That's the only thing I can think of offhand." She says, "Do it." That's great. So that's what I did. I got another actress to do it with me, a girl named Connie Forsland. And um, and we did it. It went great. And I knew it when we had, you know, and he said, well, he goes, you want to sit down, Tom? And he goes, thank you, Connie. Thank you very much. And she goes, I got it. thanks, honey. You got it, Tom. And she left. And I knew I had the part. Hmm. <laughs> And he was a tough old codger, man. That guy was, he was great. I mean, he, he looked like an ex-Marine surgeon. Um, and he dressed like some guy on the cover of Field and Stream magazine. <laughs> you know, he smoked the pipe, then the baggy pants, and he had a, just a loose-fitting kind of sports shirt, nondescript, just nondescript clothes. Yeah. Um, and he, he was an old-timer. And then started as a writer, oh. and he had done movies like Blackboard Jungle. Oh, um, yeah, that's right. The one, let's see, the one the Truman Capote thing in Cold, in Blood. Cold Blood. In Cold Blood. Yeah. Uh, he did Cat on a Hot Tin Roof with Newman and um, Liz Taylor. He did uh, Sweet Bird of Youth with Newman and Geraldine Page. He did Bring Me the Head of. Yes. Desert. What's that, Valdez? Or no, I don't no. know. Bring me the Some, yeah. yeah. So and so Garcia. Yeah. I don't know that one. Um, that's it. Alfredo Garcia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia. And then he did. Um, uh, oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, he yeah, did a lot. I'm blanking. He yes. did a lot. <laughs> he did a lot of mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. So, uh, how after that, that's your, that's your very first film that you've done, like professionally? Or at all? Uh, no, I had a small part in the very end of um, of the Sentinel, and we shot it in Brooklyn. I remember, I had a, like a lightweight suit, but um, and I'm and I'm with my wife, and we're supposed to be from the Midwest, buying, looking for an apartment in Brooklyn. Okay, and um, the um. What's her name? Well, she's famous. She dated Frank Sinatra. She's the only one that Mia Farrow. No, no. Oh, Ava Gardner. Before. Ava Gardner. Wow. You're there. welcome. And I went, wow. You know, this was yeah. one of my dad's favorites. <laughs> 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 yeah, this was one to write home about. But <laughs> and she was a trip, man. She really was. I um, I remember seeing her just sitting on a stoop. She's playing the real estate agent. And she's just sitting on the stoop talking to all these uh, Brooklynites, you know, in the neighborhood there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. And then I remember her wardrobe lady coming out. I Like, it's so hot. It is so hot and muggy that I could smell it going by. It was a scotch. <laughs> I actually smelled it going by on a tray. <laughs> it was a scotch. You could, uh, you know, it's when it's so hot, you could smell every smell. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And there's no wind or anything. Right, right. it's just, just stagnant. Dead air. Yeah. Stinky air. Yep. I mean, what's, what's that? Like, Jesus, she's drinking a scotch in the middle of the day in this kind of weather? Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> Those old timers, uh, man. Well, yeah. yeah. They don't make oh, yeah. Like that old timers. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I did ask her. I said, I had to ask you something. I said, I, I didn't know you were from North Carolina, but I said, are you part Cherokee? And she said, Yeah, I am. I said, thought so. Ava Gardner. Had, yeah, you know, she just had like the cheekbones. And yeah, the, and the skin. Yeah, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. color and the yep. the black hair and everything. And I and you know and all you know she always had these great looks, but she was always exotic looking. Exotic, you know, like, that, yeah, yeah. You know, like she could have been Hispanic or Italian mm-hmm. or something, but but she was part Indian. Yeah. I did not know that. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. So now you move on. What was the first? Uh, 
like, did you get a lot of uh, recognition for looking for Mr. Goodbar? Or what was the first movie that really everybody's like, oh, this guy's a star? I did. Uh, well, yeah, and I remember Diane Keaton saying, "You're gonna, you're, you're gonna get some work out of this one." I go, "You think so?" She goes, "Yeah." I go, "Yeah, with this character, come on." She goes, Mm-mm, "No, no, it's just a good acting role, and you, you know, you'll see, you'll get something out of it." And and well, both Richard Gere and I like got written up in the calendar section of the LA Times. So yeah, we did get started yeah. there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so then that uh leads to other things. Um let's see later on, I guess the the, the big chill, that was a pretty big one for you. Mm-hmm. And uh uh w- when when did you uh what what was the, I guess Eddie the, the first cruises. actually Eddie oh, yeah. the cruises, although not big at the theaters was became the first um cable hit oh it had this huge following interesting year, yeah, i remember you know, it had kind yeah. of a cult following yeah and it was and it, yeah and i remember like some guy we were working in spain on this movie and some guy like starts reading it. i mean i think he's it because he was also a comedian i think he's just like you know jerking my chain or something but it was true it was in the trades so yeah and then eventually in the mid 80s you get into uh platoon with oliver stone and charlie mm-hmm. sheen and all that stuff uh when we mm-hmm. spoke on the phone before um pl- you, platoon came up a few times um so I, I take it that's one of your favorites well yeah it is i mean it's kind of like i i don't know i remember telling the guys before we, we were going on our last little hump that was going to last two days out in the bush and we'd been three weeks in there, and one day, I mean, we, it was we were being trained by this Marine captain who'd done three tours of duty in Vietnam, and um, he had, he himself had ended up at at uh, um, uh, what was Way Way City during the Tet Offensive, huh. where it rained so much and there was so much cloud cover they had no air support, and where it rained so much, I mean, their uniforms were rotting off them. Of, you know, mm-hmm. it was, yeah, it just, uh, it, yeah, it's horrible. Just but, constantly wet. Yeah. I, I guess yeah. you know that, or remember that Platoon is a real bone of contention with me, right? No. no. <laughs> I'll refresh your memory. No. Why is that? Yes, tell us. So uh, I was, you know, living in New York. I auditioned. Pat Golden brought me in for Platoon, and I, I read for Tax, which was actually a bigger scene i mean a bigger role than yeah than it ended up being uh uh-huh. so the machine gunner yeah yeah yep and so i uh i came in i, I read for um uh, oliver and i got mm-hmm. the part but then it was at the time do you know dan Lorenis was i think funding it something happened dino? what's his name dino de Lorenis? yeah yeah wasn't he that was the first time okay uh they lost their funding okay so a year, year and a half later, I get called back in. The casting director calls me back in. Uh, I go in, and I read uh, just again for Oliver. Right. And Oliver goes, <laughs> okay, you got it. Let's, but you got to talk to, call your agent right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there. This is the deal. Tell them this is the deal. And it, it, there's no negotiation, nothing. I'm like, okay, no problem. I was just so happy to get this role because it was such a great script. So... Then we get set up. I get brought out to L.A. We're getting ready to leave, and SAG would not. Do you remember this when SAG would not give consignatory because they wanted to ship everybody off on cargo planes and put everybody in tents and and and, and feed them K rations mm-hmm. instead of real food. You remember that? No, I don't. And I think I was on the last round when of that film started. I think it went through three or four like little upstarts and then and each time it kind of broke oliver's heart because it kept getting canceled right well i i think i was on the last round which that's number three or four i'm not sure but and the only thing the only thing i remember about this was that we were going to do three weeks of jungle training with captain die Right, well, and that was like and you weren't you going to get paid for it, right, <laughs> Captain? Yeah. Did y'all get paid for doing it or no? I no, I don't. Uh, uh-uh, that was the. I thing. don't think so, but yes. I don't think so. But we got, we did get expenses, and we got, um, and we got our salaries that we negotiated. Right, right. Well, anyway, long story short, 
I got left behind. I uh, the plane took my off without agent you. Agent called me and said, "There's a little hitch, but well, you know, don't worry about it. You sh- you're going to be gone for 16 weeks, or I forget how ever long." And I said, well, "You should go home and visit your family." You know, and I'm like, "That's a great idea." This is before cell phones, right? So <laughs> I I went to Texas. In the meantime, nobody could get in touch with me. Oh my. I came back and my room was canceled and everybody had left. Oh, <laughs> oh man. Everybody was gone. <coughs> who who I, ended well, up playing but, text? I well, can't remember. Because uh, <coughs> Oliver Stone got in a fight with my manager. So you had uh, to They suffer. were negotiation. They tried to renegotiate and he got pissed off. And at the end, he just said, he said, okay. And then he thought about it afterwards and said, no, I'm not doing it. I had it. <sighs> Man. So I don't know who you, ended up paying tax. Did you fire that manager? Well, eventually, yeah. Uh, you shouldn't but, fire. We went off to well, so movie. Tom, how how was my, my uh, how was the shoot without Bo? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you knew that story. <laughs> Remember the guy that was left behind? What did he miss? Everybody, everybody on the show knows that, that knows pretty much knows the story about the guy that got left behind. It was me. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> oh God, yeah. I, I mean, you know, it. It, I, it when we also right before we started, the revolution broke out in the Philippines. Yes, Oliver yeah. was already there, and Dale Dye was already there. They were already there, and, and much of the crew, I guess. And um, and I'm and Oliver told me later. He said, "I just thought, here we go again. This mm. revolution is going to." just you know kill kill this project yeah because we just we, we just can't do it in the middle of this so at what happened so i remember flying out and i'm i guess when I, the day i hit or maybe it was the night before i'm not sure uh the revolution broke out and i was in the air or something and i get to la and i check into a hotel in the valley and um and this hotel uh, happened to have um, a bunch of Filipinos working as doormen, you know, in parking ballets and mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. So every morning I'd go out and get the news from them. Although there was news on television, I'd get the news from them. And they would tell me because they'd call home. Hmm. And they'd give me the even better news. updates than the news. Yeah. And so I sat in a hotel for three or four days. And one morning, I, my phone rings, and it's a, a reporter I know from Florida, from a newspaper in Fort Lauderdale, with the Fort Lauderdale paper. And, and he said, well, get your bags packed. I go, oh, I'm in L.A. waiting to go. And he said, well, it's it's over. Revolution's over. I go, no shit. But yeah, turn the TV, run down, see the Filipinos again, and flew out the next morning. <laughs> And, um, you know, and then, then it started, you know, a day or two at the hotel and then into the bush. Where you lost about 30 pounds. <laughs> yeah, it was. And then at like the very last day before we went on the last hump, we had, it was like a two day thing. And we'd be we wouldn't be in our base camp so much, but out just somewhere else, you know, on, the, on some grid square out there. And I and um and I remember like lining up to go broke character. And I told these guys, I said two things after watching everything I've seen during this training period of three weeks and the reading we did a week ago for Oliver. I said, I was sitting in the front row of that classroom, which was the uh, uh, first Filipino infantry division headquarters. And then within one of their classrooms that we did this reading. So I'm sitting in the front row and I said, I just listened to everybody. I didn't look at any. I just could hear it. Mm. And I said, I got to tell you, I think we're on to something. I think one day, I think this will be a film classic. I think it'll be a war classic. I think one day, like those guys that were in on the waterfront, you will tell your children and your grandchildren that you were in this. Hmm. And and what's his name? Bunny Kevin Dillon. He he quoted me on that. He said, "I didn't know what Berenger was talking about." 
Huh. It does He's now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> There's a yeah. story that you told uh, in another interview once um, w- about a, a conversation you and Charlie Sheen had um, when he recalls he thought he might be there, might have been there when he was a kid. Do you know the story? Oh, yes. Yeah. That was one day where, like, there it, it's uh, the electricians are, are changing a few lights here or something and the grips and they, they're moving a few cables around and. And, and Charlie and I are sitting there, and we look across the, just across the little clearing in the jungle, and he says, I'm not, I go, look at the, those guys over there all looking at you, I think. He said, yeah, I noticed that. I go, why? He said, the Filipinos are pretty quiet. They were in the, mm-hmm. They're not a noisy bunch. Right, yeah. polite. And, um, mm-hmm. and um, he said... I think they recognized me from when I was here with my dad. Yep, Apocalypse Now. And Apocalypse, I went, well, yeah, that could be. These guys do a lot of war films, apparently, Jungle War. And I said, uh, and some of them look old enough to, you know, have been there 10 years ago or whatever it was. He says, yeah, I think that's it. I, I got a couple of them look familiar to me anyway. I went, yeah, that could be it. I go, um... I said, did you shoot here in Luzon on this island? He went, yeah. I go, uh, I go, yeah, my dad was here too. And, <laughs> and he said, what movie did he do? Said, what? <laughs> what movie was he in? I went, um, the war? Charlie, it was the war, the big one, the real one. What? I go, World War II, he landed here in the liberation of the Philippines. He goes, oh. Oh. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. That's pretty good. How how was that? What? (laughs) What? How was uh, how was that experience shooting out there? I mean, was it? Uh, I mean, it looks know, just I, hot I, and sweaty I, and wet. Yeah, it was, but of course we were in good shape, you know. Yeah, and we and we and we. Yeah. I mean, everybody was exercising. You know, John McGinley's jumping rope. I'm jumping rope while doing sit ups, push ups. You know, in our rooms and you know, I'm swimming laps in the pool. You know, and then one day I remember I'm like, I, one day I remember it's like everybody was at work. I was off that day, and it was daytime on a night shoot and i'm so i'm just swimming laps in this huge empty pool big pool and i'm just swimming laps swimming laps swimming laps swimming laps, swimming laps, swimming laps. and then as i come to the wall or something like after i don't know like halfway through or something I come to the wall and i and i put my hand up to t- and i and i see a couple of feet there i go what i want to stop i look up it's oliver He's looking down at me he goes what are you doing I go, what am i doing i'm swimming laps why? He goes, maybe you should go out there today. I go, to the set? He goes, yeah. I go, why? He said, the guys like you to be there. I think it would be good if you're there with them for their scenes. Went, okay, all right. Um, let me just finish up here and I'll you know, get it right out there. So I go out there and I'm not like even in my camis or anything you know my utilities i'm just like you know in in flip-flops and shorts and a t-shirt and and i'm standing there just watching scenes and he comes up to me goes what are you doing i go i'm watching the scenes he said i i I go what he says you're making them nervous (laughs) (laughs) you told me to come out here and here i am he goes yeah but you're looking at him and you're making him nervous wow. so what well, he probably uh, wanted you to Jesus. suit up yeah. then one time he came into the makeup trailer and he says tom can i talk to you now yeah i'm like i'm the only one in there everybody else is like i had had to do 25 minutes for that makeup <clears throat> two cups of coffee no big deal um her in there and, and he walks in he wants to talk to me you know because yeah he says gordon can you excuse us yeah, gordon, says, yeah sure and gordon walks out have smoke or something outside and then and he says um 
listen, I I noticed that you've been staring at the assistant operator, the focus guy. <laughs> and I went, yeah. <laughs> well, I think you're making him nervous. I go, Oliver, I said, that guy has blown focus on more of those tracking shots that you seem to be very <laughs> fond of uh, fond of and wants. And I understand that it gives you movement through the jungle, low infantry kind of movement. And I said, um, makes sense to me. And we got him coming up in the fight scene. Right. And he said, yeah, I go, well, how many times is this guy going to blow focus? <laughs> He goes, yeah, but you're making him nervous. I go, I'm making him blow focus? <laughs> it's your fault. I'm making him blow focus? I go, what are we going to do if it's a night scene and it's low lighting? It's yeah. going to be a nightmare. And I said, yeah. how close are we to Australia? Why can't we get an operator, uh, uh, assistant operator, assist, assistant camera AD out of Australia and fly him up here? I said, there's got to be some available guys in, in, you know, Sydney or over in New Zealand or something. There's got to be somebody that can come in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that guy was the only guy that got a bad review in the entire movie. Huh. Yep. It actually showed up. Huh. So, so you, you mean like pretty, a critic's review? Pretty, nailed it and mentioned his name. Wow. Wow. Then I hear from crew people later on. I go, yeah. I go, let me tell. You, well, well, yeah. What? And they said, well, I'll tell you what happened to him. He one day just came in the Panavision. It just brought all his equipment in and everything he had. And he said, that's it. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> and he says, and he went into props. Probably a good place. For yeah. Him. All right. Yeah. I said, yeah, well, he could blow it there, too. <laughs> I said, I happen to like prop guys, but this guy is a nervous wreck. I go, you know, it's e even, you know, amiable, nice, relaxed Jackie Stewart, the race car driver, said, you lose your nerve, you can't race anymore. Yeah, that's true. Like, well, yeah. These guys are really on that edge. They, you know, well, that's that's tough. Like, it's just quickly explain to the audience like what you mean. Like when you blow focus, like the you know, explain to them well, what it means because it is a tough job. The, the operator's looking through the lens, okay, and mm -hmm. he's you know you know panning the camera or, or whatever. He's you know, he's directly right behind up, the camera, up or down, looking through the lens, and the focus guy is is pre measured the scene. So he, and also along a track that could change because you're going along a track, your, your distance changes towards the the subject that you're you're shooting, and, and you know so it, it's the focus will change, of right, course. Right. Um, and sometimes you'd be going directly towards the actor, or you're going by them, or they're alongside of you, which means you got to keep up with them. You know, and then that's the the key grip pushing them the dolly grip pushing the camera along the track, but that's his deal now. So both those guys have to be in coordination. Yeah. And, and a lot of times they not, have, I'm not saying this stuff is easy. No, I know. It, yeah. It isn't. And now they have long. remote, remote focus for, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. And, yeah. And <clears throat> that's tough too. You have to watch a monitor and focus as you're going. But, yeah. You know, it's a, so it's that, a pain, you know, that was an important thing. And, and Charlie started complaining about it. And I think I did say something. Else. I go, listen, it isn't just me. I go, Charlie noticed it too. Mentioned something to me about it. And I, and I went, yeah, you're right. I'm about fucking had it with this shit, you know? So, so it wasn't, just, it wasn't snakes or giant spiders. It was focus no. pullers that plagued the, uh, the shoot of platoon. Well, yeah, but I mean, <laughs> somehow we got by all that. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, I figured at that point, Oliver might just explode on the guy, you know. Uh, yeah, about and, Oliver. I, I've heard but, different but, stories. But, <laughs> but speaking of snakes, there was one one um, uh, grip that got bit because I got bit on the foot by, a, by um, well, there were plenty of cobras. We saw cobras, but there's a pit viper, you know, smaller snake, you know. Yeah. You don't see him as well sometimes, but he got bit by a pit viper. His foot started blowing up, and they got him in a car and just raced into Manila. Uh. Um, and he and he was okay. But I said, you know, it's interesting how many of these how many of these guys um, 
are either in flip flops or tennis oh. shoes. <laughs> tennis shoes okay, but I but the flip flops I go why because. There's roots coming out of the ground. It's so easy to stub your toe sure. or break your toe on those roots. Yeah. I, it, just from the thought of the snakes, I'd be wearing like cavalry yeah. boots. I wouldn't. Yeah. Be, <laughs> no way. Oh, yeah. Flip flops. Yeah. Same thing in East Africa. Well, but the, but po the so point is many. people are completely unaware of where they are and they wear flip flops uh, in the yeah. jungle. I know. I think they know, but they're a little bit fatalist, the Filipinos I found too. Oh, these like, are these oh, are the locals. Yeah, yeah, the locals. Oh, I yeah. thought you meant people uh, in the crew. Well, they well they were the Filipinos on the crew. Yes. Oh, oh okay. So I think okay. All right, so the, and those were the people that had remembered Charlie's dad. You yes, know, the older ones. Yes. Back to um, the uh, the back to the beginning of that uh, question there. Um, but they, you know, I mean, I, I'm not saying there weren't any any Americans, but they were usually like department heads. Uh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. So how, how did you get along uh, with uh, Oliver? I've heard so many stories. It's Hollywood legend, this guy, you know, yeah. uh, of how he directs and stuff. Like one time he called Michael Douglas and right before a scene and said, hey, what, what's uh, what's going on with you? He said, no, I'm fine. He goes, you're not you're not uh, you're not back on cocaine, are you? He goes, what? He goes, yeah, no. Uh, I got I got used to his quirky yeah, sense of humor. Yeah. I did. I, I yeah, and just and yeah. then he go, uh, you sure you're you're sober, right? He goes, yeah, dude. What are you What are you saying? Yes. He goes, okay, go on, do your scene then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he got him all agitated. Maybe that's what he wanted. That's that's what he wanted. To go do the scene. He, he, do like he wanted him hyper and agitated for the scene or something. Yeah, yeah. that's what he wanted. <laughs> so maybe that's why he asked you to come to the set instead of swim. <laughs> What, did but he that ever, didn't make sense. That see that one didn't make sense to me. But it, it's like was he an actor's uh, director or? Uh, or oh, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and you know, when the other thing was, Oliver expected you to do your homework, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you did your homework. You had you had it all there. He was he would say a word. Yeah, you, you know, it's like great cut. Let's move on. You know, kind of thing. And he could shoot fast too. Oh but, wow, nice, but. Okay. But um, uh, I I remember like saying I I always had ideas, but I would hit directors, and this was before Oliver too. But I would hit them way in the beginning, you know, like like the very first couple of days of shooting, if we were on the set, or even before that, I would go listen. Blah, 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 like, like throw ideas at them early on, so they could ponder them, think about them. And not have to do it on the set the day of. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And um, I, um, without, like, I would do stuff and it, it, it would be, it could have been a month and a half before we got to the scene. And he would come up and he goes, you remember that thing you said about, I went, yeah, I goes, do it. Uh -huh. Yep. Hmm. That's what but, sets you apart from so many other actors, Tom. I'm, this is serious. Um, you're always so prepared, and uh, and you do bring a lot to the table as an actor to a director. And I've seen you do it, and well, thanks, uh, you know that's that's what sets you apart from so many. Because you know I work with a lot of actors, <laughs> yeah, I'm, and you do too. I mean, I just like when we were doing Gettysburg, and an actor I'm not going to mention his name c comes walking up with the script under his arm, and a very well known actor, and says, "Hey guys, does anybody?" know if uh, my character dies in this movie <laughs> you know oh i know what you're talking about yeah. <laughs> i remember because yeah. you indignantly about face and walked away yeah <laughs> and i i mean and everybody there had, had done research on their character right you know yeah we were all talking about you know yeah and you were quizzing yeah. other actors about you know what they knew you know yeah uh, oh, yeah. uh, you wanted to know if, if what kind of if they were up to snuff or not, and right in the middle, like on cue, this guy walks up. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Everybody's jaw dropped, including yeah. Ron. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, uh, like how do you? And there, there was like a lot of people there. Yeah, too. There, it was a big circle of so, us. Yeah. And yeah. the guy wasn't joking. This dead is completely serious. serious. Nope. <laughs> dead serious. Oh God. Uh, he oh just wasn't there. I mean, he was okay in the scene. He yeah, was, he was. But, yeah. Yeah. And um, it's a nice little scene, but mm -hmm. I, I'm like, whoa. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I Oof. won't be breaking bread with you. 
Yeah. yeah, it is It is a nice scene, and I'm not going to say because I don't want to give away who it is, because Bo told me the story, and I went and I watched the scene, and you, um, as Longstreet, you you play, you know, you're, you're actually kind of friendly to the guy, and, and yep. you know, and uh, to me, that goes to show what it, yeah, kind of yeah. joking around, it's kind of a funny yeah. scene, and uh, to me, it just goes to show uh, the mark of a good actor that you can not let that stuff get in the way <laughs> and go ahead and do the job the way you're supposed to do it in this scene. Well, I, I kind of thought, hey, this sort of works in a way. Mm -hmm. You used it. Because, um, okay, yeah. I, I mean, that, I see. that character is like a very smart person in yes. reality, right? Right. But I'm kind of treating them like a, like a little boy or something. You yes. Know, oh, did you really? Uh, that's nice. Yeah, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right, now let's get back to work. <laughs> right. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. No. Right. Okay, yes. that's a good point. So, to actually use it, you can actually use it. Too. And by and in in reality, he's not one of you. He's not. Uh, he's not a military man by training. No. <laughs> no. So that also works too. He's kind of an outsider with a job that mm -hmm. you know isn't really mm -hmm. what belongs to him. Um. So it. Did, is it true that uh, there were several roles um, that you were considered for that ended up being Kevin Costner roles, like uh, uh, Untouchables and Dances with Wolves no. and JFK? That's not true. No, uh, you, your um, IMDb is incorrect. Yeah, no the uh, the only I think betrayed the one I did with Deborah Winger. I think he was interested in that but i'm not sure okay so that was just that's uh, what I'm, I'm thinking piece of yeah. misinformation you, i found you worked uh, okay so the original story uh with the Ke uh, with the kevin cosner character that died uh, -huh. uh so there was a whole diff almost a different movie shot right? oh in the big chill you're in talking the big about chill didn't he have one of the? He was kind of like the lead character, and then he gets completely mm -hmm. cut out. No, no, no. What? It's like in in the, the Big Chill, there was the scene that is at the end of the movie, and it's a flashback scene, mm. and you actually see him for the first time at the end of the movie uh. because we have talked about him. We've been to his funeral. We have advertised him and missed him and, you know, uh -huh. paid homage and all this kind of stuff. And then you see all of us at the University of Michigan and we're, we're younger and we're, you know, more kind of, you know, goofy, I guess, or something. Uh -huh. um, and, and innocent. Um, and, and so then, then you see him in that and you see him wearing a leather jacket. That Meg gives to Bill Hurt. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And um, and there's like little other little things, you know, like the whole thing of throwing the spaghetti on the on the refrigerator against the wall, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and some other stuff that that like people mention in there that maybe doesn't register real big, mm -hmm. but it would have if you'd seen the last scene. Ah, I see. Yeah. It would have it would have been in your subconscious, and then you went, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. some mention of that or some, you know, something. Yeah, yeah. So it um, was probably the uh, it was uh, the producer's cut that cut the end out. I guess. Well, it was. I I think probably the studio's cut. Yeah, um, studio's cut. Warner Brothers, but it the thing was like I remember we had a meeting about it. Larry says, well, you know, they're talking about cutting the scene here. He might mm. like, call us all together. I don't know when this was. I can't, I can't remember when we had this meeting because it seemed like we were at the studio in a conference room or something. Huh. And, and it wasn't before we started. Huh. And it had to be after we finished. Yeah. yeah. And, and I don't know why we were all in the same room. But anyway, there we were. And he he said, I, they're talking about cutting the scene and stuff. And blah, 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 but, you know, and one person said, oh, I really like that. And, well, you know, and somebody else says, nah, I don't know. I think I did. You could go. You know, kind of thing. But I I said, you know, it's it's a bit. And Larry, like, wrote this. So he's just kind of nodding his head, listening. Not being judgmental at all. But I, and I said, I, you know, I, I, 
maybe I'm off here. I said, but I had a feeling that this scene was like a scrapbook. Like if we had all sat at the couch and looked at a bunch of old photos of each other and started laughing and whatnot. Huh. You know, like how we do, uh -huh. <laughs> right. you know, yeah. as families or, or groups, of, you know, friends. Oh, yeah, I remember that all. Oh, God, that's right. You know. Right. And, and I, I said, that, that's. I think that's what that scene was about because we. I don't know about you all, but I wasn't really sure what it was all about. Why were we, you know, it's at the end of the, I, I can see why it's at the end of the movie now, but I go, that's, I don't know, that's what I, think we did it for was a scrapbook huh. yeah. that's my metaphor for it anyway yeah yeah do you find that directors but genuine or generally uh don't mind it when actors get involved with things like that like uh, kind of have those conversations uh, with them no i think they welcome it you know i think they really do i, I certainly think the good ones do uh -huh. uh, they you know they question themselves every writer does sure well, that's you know they, I mean, until an audience, until a writer has an audience, he doesn't know what he's got there. That's right. You know. Yep. That's why Ron was so good to work with. Uh, I would bring him scenes and go, you know what, this this doesn't work very well. Can I? Do you mind if I? Literally, I, I'm not kidding you. Do you mind if I rewrite some of the dialogue? And I sat down sure. with Marty, uh, Martin Sheen, and and we would go over it and kind of rewrite it and I'd bring it back to him and, and Ron would look at it and go, oh no, you know, I like that a lot better. Yeah, okay. let's do that. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, you know, I mean, Ron had been an actor once too, hadn't he? A what? An actor. He'd been uh, an actor uh, once. Well, in college and stuff, he did some Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 it's like that. Now, there's some people who are so rigid. You go, oh boy, we're in trouble here. Oh yeah, mm. they're they're they're. This words is are all about stone. him. This is all about you know. He yeah. doesn't get the the whole idea of what theater and right filmmaking are supposed to be. You know, <laughs> a collaborative what, what drama, drama and comedy are supposed to be. Yeah, they yeah. don't get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, like Tennessee Williams. That's what was so great about him. I hear you got the best playwright in, in our in our American history. Yep. And 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 he he would give huge credit to the actors that were in his plays. <clears throat> and he said, and, you know, and then of course the playwright is also in the theater with the actors and the director doing rewrites. Yep. Before and maybe this could even be when they're in Boston and Philly before they get to Broadway in New York. But once they do that, that's it. You know, the yeah. play gets printed up, and that's word Samuel word French and yeah. Samuel French and Sons, and you know the other the other publishers, and that's it. It's locked in forever. But until then, it's a work in progress. Yeah, and so if like you've ever done a new play, and I've done a couple, yeah, I've, I've done a couple of the playwrights there. And, and you're changing things um, where it works better or I don't know, you know, makes more sense or something. Yeah. I mean, there's times I wish I'd had a playwright around and they weren't dead or gone or, you know, <sighs> weren't available because you go, what is he trying? To, what is he saying here? Why is this scene here? Yeah. There must be a reason for it. You know, this thing got done 150 performances or something. I, I, I go, what, what, uh, you know, have you, there has to be a reason for this. What? And, when's the last time you've done a, a play? You know, when you get as a film actor, you start doing films, you go from job to job. Right? Yeah. And you get so far away from, from what inspired us to be actors to begin with. Theater. Sure. And there's yeah. a lot of us. Tom yeah. and I, for sure. There's a lot of actors that have never stepped foot on stage. But uh, when's the last time you did a show, a play? The last time was um, a play, a new play called national anthems uh the playwright on four um back in time i'm i'm, I'm my memory's failing me here but he he might have had even been a remission when we were doing mm, mm. Um, a second version of, of the finished product right mm -hmm. and so he um so he was there for rewrites and, and stuff and um and it was a hell of a play. It really was. It was brilliant. It's a three-character play in mm. two acts. And um, here again, that's the second time I got the silent audience. 
Oh, wow. In your life. And it did. <laughs> it did. Do you wow. prefer yeah. stage to, to screen? And it was, it was, it was Kevin Spacey and Mary McDonald. Oh, wow. And wow. And it was a great it was, cast. Yeah, they were great. They're, they're oh, really, man. really, really good, good actors <clears throat> and good theater actors and stuff. And, and so we we had a hell of a run there. Once again, sold out, standing room only. Wow. Yeah, in uh, the Warren War Theater in, in New Haven. And we had Broadway people coming up, and we got great reviews and all the New York papers and stuff. And we tried to get to Broadway. What happened was, like, each one of us started getting different film gigs. That, yep. You know, Mary mm -hmm. ended up doing Dances with Wolves. Right. And and uh, I don't know what Kevin was doing. I was, I don't know. We Usual just, Suspects, but, but, maybe? <laughs> it might have been. That was thought, around yeah. that time, right? But this, that's what yeah, happens. Yeah. You get pulled off. Yeah. You know. Uh, so do you, Tom? Do you your schedules are all different. Yeah. yeah. Do you prefer yeah. doing stage to screen, Tom, or like if 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 it wasn't you know if the money was all the same, let's say money wasn't an issue, what would you rather do? Probably stage. Yep. Is it what is it the 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 thrill of being in front of an audience or? It sounds terrifying um, to me. It's a every, every well sometimes is different. Sometimes, but it, 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 you can find nuances every, every performance. Yeah, uh, you could, yeah, it's, it's, it should be different every night. Yeah. Like, How do you mean different? You can change the words? No. No. Nuances. No, it's just, you discover as you yeah. go along. Every performance, yeah. you might discover more about that character. And that can't be done character. in seven takes in Did a you, film? Yeah. And I mean, if you were yeah. like working with somebody like John Cassavetes, you never knew what he was going to throw at you. Yeah. Yeah. And you'd get this almost little smile on your face going, come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to improvise? Let's go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, but I get it, though. It's on stage. It's an immediate, like, adrenaline rush, and you can't yeah. get it back. There is no doing over. It's just, boom, it's that moment, and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so before we get to Gettysburg, which of course is what everybody's uh, you know all nerdy about here, um, Major League was another big one for you. Uh, were, you said you played baseball. Were you a catcher? No. No. Third base. Third base. Um, did you have to have uh, like a, a catcher work with you, or did you just naturally? I mean, you well, look like Steve you Yeager. know how to be a catcher. It was, it was. Oh yeah, it was Steve Yeager, but he and and he. Um, yeah. Um. And he was there through the whole shoots as well. But he and Charlie and I started early. Okay. Before everybody. Then there was a kind of, uh, I don't know, like maybe a week in Tucson, Arizona, where we just practiced and whatnot, you know? Yeah. And then we had, um, um, and then we started shooting. But we started shooting in Tucson because that, that little stadium there was, um, where the Cleveland Indians, that was the Grapefruit League out there in Arizona. And um, most of the teams are in Florida, but there was a you know league out there. Mm -hmm. So Is uh, still that's alive? Where, that's, at least that's where Cleveland was now. I think they're in Florida now. Uh, is, Steve, is Steve Yeager still alive? Yes. I remember uh, when I worked out with you guys with Steve Yeager at Pepperdine that time, and mm -hmm. I remember him catching the ball with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, and I was like, wow, yep. this old timer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. wow. <laughs> hey, you got to love that. <laughs> he told me he, he told me he used to, I used to have a, I'd sneak a cigarette in the dugout. I go, what? <laughs> the camera, the TV. Uh, yeah, but he says the cameras aren't on me all the time. <clears throat> <laughs> Every time I saw that camera coming over towards the dugout, you know, and he says, and it's not necessarily focusing on me, you know, right. they're just in there looking at the manager or the next guy batter up or, you know, some pitcher uh, getting ready to walk out or what. Yeah, I don't know, you know, so, so he would come by and he says, I just put the cigarette down next to me, not next to my hip on the bench. Golly. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> those guys were rot gut back in the old days. Those baseball players yeah. were rough yeah. around the edges, yeah. man. They yeah, smoked, oh, yeah. Drank, you know. No, I know. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> that's what's so good about those old timers. <laughs> Jeez, that style there. All right, so um, so you ended up doing two major leagues, though, right? But there's major league one and two. Yeah, but I want to just want to say Yeager was a great teacher. Not everybody yeah. is a good teacher. 
Yeah. Uh -huh. But, you know, they don't know how to teach somebody what they do. Right. And, and he was excellent. He yeah, really he good. instructed me. Remember, he was. I learned a lot of stuff that I had no idea about. Mm -hmm. You know, and I played baseball mm -hmm. since I was eight years old. What, what what position did you play? Shortstop. Shortstop. Yep. Because you're not tall. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, Bo. Shorty. Just kidding. Um, all right, Tom. Tom, uh, you like cooking? No. <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, I mean. My wife's Italian. Come yeah. on. So yeah. you like eating? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but so does she. <laughs> like all Italians. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I told her when I met her, I said, you know, I said, I was practicing Italian and learning it, you know, when I, right before I went to Italy and I said, and I got to do my first time and, and I'm doing a film with Marcello Mastriani and it's Italian director, Italian crew, this and that. So I'm, you know, and I said, the bartender in the hotel also spoke Spanish. So he said, you speak to me in Italian. If you don't know a word, say it in Spanish and I'll give you the Italian word. I said, great. So he was like, you know, reinforcing my vocabulary sure. and whatnot. Yeah. And, um, but, uh, but I told her, I said, you know, it's like, I'm not about you, but her parents were, were immigrants, you know, so she was, I, and she spoke fluent Italian, Venetian dialect, and would go back as kids and stay there with relatives and for three weeks, you know, and that kind of thing. And, and quite comfortable with it. But I told her, I said, you know the point? I go, it's not necessarily true of American Italians. I said, but Italian Italians. I said, one thing I noticed, they were always talking about food. From the time you got to the set in the morning to the time you left, it was like, what are we having for lunch? Where did you have dinner last night? Do you know this restaurant? <laughs> and I can hear them talking about it or what they had the night before. Right, right. While you're, you know, on the set. And I got over to hear them and like my stomach would start growling. Oh, yeah. Where otherwise I wouldn't be thinking about it. Right. You know, you know, I just wouldn't be thinking about it. But they had you thinking about that kind of stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh,. <laughs> The the end of our shows, we we play out a song called Gary Owen, and mm -hmm. uh, you have an interesting tie to that song, don't you? Well, I yeah, my great 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 grandfather um, wrote it, and he he was a, a poet songwriter. Uh, eighteen early eighteen hundreds up until the eighteen. It's about 1850 or somewhere in there. Um, and he wrote that, and he also wrote The Minstrel Boy, in you know, both songs we've all heard. Um, huh. And we were we were up at Sturgis for Bike Week, and we heard this guy playing the bagpipes at a, at a, at a rally. And then he showed up right next door to us, he and his wife. Hmm. They were both motorcycle riders and they had been motorcyclists in the nypd in the bronx that's where they met and they married and here they were and then he says i'm the guy that played the back oh yeah God, that was great blah, blah, blah. you know and i said are you at then we're in front of this cop i said are they the emerald society and he goes yep yep i go so you played the saint patrick's day parades with the nypd and he goes yes i said how about inspectors funerals i got to do that goes, oh yeah yeah Twenty of those, he says. You're not even just New York City. Sometimes we go upstate or down to Texas and play and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. He said, and then I still play, of course, for some of these things, even when I'm retired. Um, and he showed up here in Florida where we're at, right? Mm -hmm. um, but he that day out there in Yellowstone, and we were packing up, getting ready to leave and stuff, and they were getting ready to go on a, on a motorcycle ride in the park, and. Um, and he played both of those songs when I told him that he had written those. And that, that's Thomas Moore? Yeah, and he, this is interesting too, there is a, a restaurant called uh, Tom Moore's Tavern or something like that. It's in Bermuda, 
and it's the house was built in 1600 something or other. He had been there in 1801 or two, something like that. Yeah. And you go, what is he doing in Bermuda? And why was he in this house here, right? Uh -huh. Living in it. Well, he was working for the British Admiralty because he had five kids. So I guess writing music wasn't enough to support him. Right. So he had a job at the Admiralty, which is, you know, like a civilian job, like obviously uh, administrator of some type of, you know, probably supply, I would imagine, you know. Uh -huh for British ships um, and decided he wanted to go visit America and he got a hold of the um, British ambassador in Washington, D.C. and said he wanted to come to visit, maybe go up to Boston and, you know, New York and all that. And he said, yeah, fine, you're very welcome. You can stay here at the embassy, et cetera, that. So he goes there and he ends up going to the White House with the mass British ambassador who introduces him to Thomas Jefferson. There's a little high, I wonder, kind of thing, you know. He met Thomas Jefferson. Thomas met. Jefferson? Yeah. Wow. Yes. You know, he says, Who's on the kid? He goes, Oh, that's Thomas Moore, the Irishman. He goes, What? He goes, Yeah. He goes, I just thought he was some little kid. Like, because he was little. And he says, No, he's married and five kids, and he works for the big guy, and they know they're done. He's. On his way up to New York now, you know, to visit. <laughs> they, wow. He says, I love his poetry. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, that's a great song. I love that uh, song. I oh, mean, yeah. it's the melody is very old, but uh, the lyrics that we all know and love uh, come from, obviously, Thomas Moore. And, um, yeah. the, you know, he actually, he wrote the... The, the original lyrics, it was uh, um, a, a drinking song that he wrote about a big beer brawl fight yes. between all these guys at, at Limerick University. And and so it, it was, you know, not military at the time. But right. Custer had a guy um, that was a major on the staff in the Civil War, and then Miles Keogh was an Irish immigrant. Mm -hmm. Anyway, after the Civil War, when the Army gets reduced, including the ranks, Custer's not a lieutenant colonel, and Keogh's a captain, and Custer gets assigned a new cavalry regiment called the 7th Cavalry. So he gets Keogh uh, to be one of his company captains, um, and uh, they head out to, you know, Fort Lincoln, Nebraska, which is their headquarters. He says, listen, Tio, we need a, a song for the 7th Cavalry. We need a regimental song. He said, you got any ideas? He goes, well, I, I do, but you know, I know you're temperate, and it's a drinking song. And he goes, well, well, hum it to me. You know? And he goes, no, no, no. He says, God, I love it. It's great. He says, well, yeah, but you got all these, you know, it's a drinking ball. Um, he said, yeah. We'll change the lyrics to something more military, which they did. So there's two sets of words. Ah, uh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Very so interesting. Somewhere. Yeah, but, yeah. So you were named after your uh, great grandfather. Apparently, one in each generation. Yeah. I'll be done. Oh, cool. Yeah, my dad and I have different middle names, we, hmm. but but um, we because you know it would probably always be firstborn because you just didn't know if you're going to have any other boys. True. Right. Yep. So, yep. Why did you why did you change the name and where did you get Behringer? Uh there already was a guy with that name in New York. Mm -hmm. He was a director on Broadway. So there was already a Tom Moore. A of, I was also yeah. he, you know, he'd been an actor. He was a, mm -hmm. a, a stage actor and he had, <clears throat> you know, he was an actor's equity before me. So we met actually one time at parties. He oh. started laughing. <laughs> 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 But I, so I just took my best friend's last name. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. Oh. All right, now. I thought it was from a bottle of wine. <laughs> it's spelled differently, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. All this time. You thought he really took it from a bottle of wine? Yeah, Behringer wine. No, no, that's spelled differently, too. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah it yeah. is. It's, yeah. 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 Okay. See, that, that that name actually, like, I kind of researched it. You know, Dino De Laurentiis, I met him once, and he goes, what is that name? He's the only person that ever asked me that. I oh. said, well, the way I spell it is French. 
I said it was the lead character in Ionesco's play, Rhinoceros. <laughs> the lead character was called Beranger. Uh, and that, that, and you know, those plays were kind of out there, but it was a kind of interesting character, too. Um, hmm. It's not a real comedy. I, it showed up, I saw it was a character in, in Day of the Jackal, which mostly takes place in France, and and there was a, I saw a character named Beranger in there, or Madame Beranger, or something like that. Then there was a king of Italy after the Romans, the Roman Empire fell apart. There was a king in northern Italy called Berenguer, it's spelled the same way. Huh. There's Berenguer. a Spanish fellow like Juan Berenguer, the pitcher, years ago played for Milwaukee, I think, or something, but G U E R. The, Ger the two German spellings. And there's an English spelling, which is B-A-R-R-I-N-G-E-R. -R. But right. I think mo I think it's kind of like alsace around that area between France and, and Germany. Uh, uh -huh. It's kind of probably where it came from, although you got this guy in Italy that kind of predates everybody else. So Do we know what it means? Know. Is it like a town or a region or is it, does it have a meaning? I don't think so. No, I don't think just so. one of those names. Yeah, it's an interesting name though. It's got a good ring to it, so good choice. Um, okay, so Gettysburg. How how did you end up getting the role of uh, General Longstreet? I was doing someone to watch over me in New York. We were doing night shooting in Queens. Um, I got a message from the office, the production office, you know, on a break there, you know, writing break or something. And um, and I had done an interview like a day or two before. I'd done an interview with the Daily News, and it was one of those simple 20 questions, 20 questions, right? Mm -hmm. and, which, you know, economically you can answer quickly. And one was, what is your best read book of the year? And I said, oh, that's easy. I said, um, I. I think it's uh, 1974 winner of the Pulitzer Prize in Historical Fiction, The Killer Angels by Michael Sharp. And then they went on to the next question. I said, Bob, the Bell and book. And they went on to the next question. Mm -hmm. And Ron saw it in the newspaper, Ron Maxwell. Okay. And I, so I got the number from the uh, production office in Manhattan. And then I meet him on the west side on a Sunday day off I meet him and um and we kind of just sat in this like it was almost empty restaurant you know it's almost empty very quiet and we talked and talked and talked and at the time uh I think it was for the part of uh, Chamberlain and I think he was thinking of Duval for he was Long Street yeah for Lee. Right, Bo? Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah. No, no, and then that changed, of course. No, it was yeah. Duval for Lee. No, Duval for Lee. It was Duval for Lee. Um, At that time, that early on? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, because Duval uh, wanted to do it. And I think he passed because he had to, he got Stalin or something. I forget what the story uh -huh. is. But when I met, I see, I met Ron Maxwell in 1989 at the, fil at the Cannes Film Festival. Right. And, uh -huh. and that's when he had just a script under his arm called Color okay. Angels. Uh, I remember distinctly when he came back away from his meeting with Tom, though, and he was elated, elated. Yeah. So, well, here's the thing. And here's the thing, too, Bo. And I, I don't remember. It might have been. God, it could have been two years later. Right. Maybe longer. I don't know. It just uh, it's all in the mist of yeah. the past at this point. But. I, it it was I was doing this play, I was doing that play with Kevin Spacey mm -hmm. up in New Haven at the Long Walk Theater, and somebody left a note with me. And I'm just getting undressed, and, you know, no big hurry. I'm just taking my time, and um, so I'm in an empty dressing room, and somebody said, "There's a guy outside waiting for you named Ron Maxwell." <laughs> really? Yeah. I, I, I go out there, and it's just him. Mm. There's nobody in the in this. He's sitting in a seat, and it's not in the theater, but, you know, outside. Yeah. Like dressing rooms in, in the lobby, mm -hmm. whatever, right? And um, so we go out there, and I go, hey, honey, it's great. It's a great, great performance, great play. Really enjoy that. I go, yeah, it's, it's, it's a killer play. It's super, 
And um, he said, well, I, said, I just want to know I'm still working on this. Still working on this. Hmm. I went, okay, well, that's good to hear. I'm glad you are. And, Geez, it'd be great. It'd be great if we could do it. I said, it's just so hard to do the Civil War. And yep. it's just such a big, big thing. Uh, yeah, I know. It can't be easy. So anyway, that's it. Don't see him. It's like another year or two. And then... I'm in L.A. For what reason, I don't remember. And then he's there, too. And they said, hey, it's a go. Bang. All right. So I talked to him on the phone. And I, you know, my agent first kind of talked to him on the phone. And then he meets at my hotel. And it's a go. And he said, Ted Turner's doing it. Yep. So we're going about I said, oh, great. Yeah. If it weren't for Ted, uh, you know. He's the guy. He's the guy that made uh -huh. it happen. He's the. I think he was introduced to Ted, as I recall, uh, at, a, at a, a round table somewhere. And uh, uh, the oh god, I just lost his name. The, the, Who? Uh, the the documentary. Uh, Ken Burns. Ken Burns, I think, introduced him. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. So, Did you? So you you had a choice though, didn't you, between what role you got? Yeah, he asked me then, and I went, "Oh God, you're kidding!" He goes, "Yeah, well, what do you what do you prefer?" I go, "Well, I like both of them." Are you kidding? You know, like, yeah. Geez, I don't know. I don't know. I said, "You know what? I guess I have to go with my own state. I got to go with South Carolina." There you go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he started yeah. laughing. I go, as, yeah, as I don't know what else to say. I did that. As did a lot yeah. of actors. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you uh, you get the role of Longstreet, um, and you know earlier we were talking about doing your homework and everything like that. How much homework did you do on Longstreet aside from uh, reading the Killer no, Angels? I don't know. I, I probably sixteen books or something like that. Um, I because I, I had time too as well, and so I just I, you know, and and it wasn't just Longstreet. It was like you know Lee's generals, you know, which is all of them. I was just mm -hmm. reading them from cover to cover, and and. Um, not just the Battle of Gettysburg either, you know. Sure. Second, Second Manassas and Antietam and, you know, all of that. Do you stop and, uh, at Gettysburg or do you read past Gettysburg no, in their I life? No, I read past it. Yeah, you read, read past, past it, okay. Course. Yeah, all the way up to the surrender, you know. Does that, is, is, is that just then, because you were... In his case, you go even after because right. like, what did he do as a civilian after that? Yeah. But now, does right. that help you as an actor to go past the moment in time you're depicting or is that just more about a curiosity? No, it does in a way because... When you get to the past thing there, you realize what good friends he was with Grant when they had been roommates for four years at West Point. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then also, you know, that when they were in the old army, after they graduated from West Point, and I don't know, lieutenants, or captains, some lieutenants probably, right? Yeah, lieutenants. At this point, I'm thinking, because, you know, I'm... Your, your promotions don't go up that quick unless you're in a war. So um, they were probably still both lieutenants then. Um, and uh, they were in St. Louis, and Longstreet's cousin came up to visit him from Georgia, and he introduced her to Grant, who fell in love with her, and they decided to get married. And Longstreet was their best man, and they had a military wedding with the swords and that whole nine yards mm. in St. Louis. And then, of course, they separate again. Longstreet ending somewhere up in New Mexico is, uh, he's now like a, no, Mexican War. Yeah. They get separated there. And then, did they run in each other in Mexico? Or I, I don't recall. I'm not sure if they did or didn't. Grant and Longstreet? Yeah, I don't uh, know if they saw each other down there or not. It's possible, but. I don't remember. Uh, they were uh, certainly not the same unit. Lee, yeah. Lee was stationed in Mason, Texas, about that same time, right? It was well, yeah, he yeah. was with the cavalry, I think. Yeah. I think something like that. Yeah, in Mason, uh, Fort probably Mason, probably fighting, fighting Comanches or some shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and then, and then yeah. you know, and and then um, uh, in, interesting side note here, but Pickett ended up being. Um, Longstreet's second in command in Mexico hmm. when they when they charge in the the, the last battle there at um, Chapultepec, Chapultepec, Mexico City, yeah. yeah. And Longstreet got got um, 
injured and handed the flag to Pickett and went over the top. Yeah. Mm. Um, and uh, that I find that interesting that those two were there together and yeah. just you know a rank apart kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, and now they're like, rank like apart at Gettysburg. Gettysburg. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but, but anyway, so at the surrender, uh, when the surrender happened, and Lee and, and Grant had begun their discussion, they were left alone at this little table, and all the officers on both sides were like standing around in a big circle watching them at a distance, you know, mm-hmm. giving privacy. And then it was done, and, and Lee got up, you know, you know, put his hat on and saluted or whatever, and then kind of watched off, got on his horse with his staff rider and headed back to say goodbye to his troops. And Longstreet's there on the edge of the crowd, and Grant, you know, caught him on the side of his eye and then calls him over. They sit down where that surrender table was, and they end up playing a game of whist, their favorite card game from college, and then <laughs> and smoking cigars, which they both liked, and particularly Grant killed yeah. him. Um, yeah, right. But uh, the... And then, um, and then, but and then after the war, I mean, first of all, he tries to get Longstreet a pardon from President Lincoln, and you know, Grant was tied with Lincoln, of course, right? Yeah. Right. But but and and Longstreet went up to Washington and met with Lincoln. And he said, "No, no pardon for you, to Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee. I can't. He, he did us too much harm, General. I just can't grant huh. you a pardon. Everybody else got it, right." And I don't think it happened until Grant became president. Then Grant gave him a job as head of customs in New Orleans. Then he got another job as ambassador to Turkey because of Grant, you know. Right, right. All these are federal government jobs. And then he got a job, his last job was head of railroads in Georgia. Oh. Yeah. And a lot of that is... is, buddy. What's that? Courtesy of his old buddy. Oh, yeah. 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 And a lot of that uh, and his is... his brother-in-law, almost a brother-in-law, right? Yeah. Yeah, right. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. A lot of that is also uh, part of the reason why he's uh, one of the villains of the lost cause religion. Yes. Um, yeah. Is because he yeah. became a Republican and worked with uh, Grant and all that stuff. And yeah. Now, when you get the role, they you know, you're going to start shooting and stuff. Uh, I got to ask this question. You know, they're getting you all set up in your wardrobe and all that jazz and they put the beard on you and now (laughs) everybody is wearing it looks like most people are wearing fake beards right Bo? you were right fake mustache yes but um what that's how i answered that (laughs) what why was that why did you answer it so uh Oh, that, I was supposed to have a mustache and a goatee, and I looked like a, a kid in a high school play. <laughs> and I went, literally walked into Ron's office and said, Ron, this is ridiculous. Because you grew your own. No. And I said, oh. goatee. I said, this is ridiculous. Please, I, I, don't make me wear this thing. And he goes, ah, yeah, it looks terrible. Just wear the mustache. Well, it's a wonderful fake mustache. But anyway, Tom, your beard, though, uh, it seems in some scenes it's uh, it's kind of got a life of its own. In other scenes, it's you know normal and everything like that. I'm sh- do you get questioned about this beard a lot? I'm, I'm well, clearly- well, I, I, I sometimes and I'm and and I, and I know one scene between Steve Lang and I got cut, and he was he was really pissed off. You know, he's pissed off at the makeup guy, and and I asked the makeup guy, I "Go, I don't know." Al, I thought, you know, you I figured you had a lot of experience with all this. This is like, you know, they called you in for the job here, right? You know, rah, rah. Mm-hmm. lots of, you know, there's lots of beards and sideburns and mutton chops and all this kind of stuff going on. And I, I don't know. I thought for the most part, everybody looked pretty good. But I said, it's just, a, you know, and he said, I'll, I'll be honest with you. He said, this was, remember originally, they said this was for television, like a miniseries. Yeah. Right. And then when he went to the movies, I went, "Uh uh-oh, this is kind of a different story. Because you'll notice. Is that why? Because the screen's bigger? Is that what you're saying? He was afraid of that. He was afraid of that. Yeah. But he said, I thought it was going to be for, I had no idea it was going to be on the big screen. And I mean, it was on some big ones in New York at the, uh, yeah. what's that theater over on the west side? Um, Uh, I don't know. It had a huge screen on it, you know. Yeah. I mean, originally you could do you could do Ben Hur and all that right. kind of 
things on that screen. Uh, uh, originally, but, uh, Ron wanted you know, <laughs> Ron wanted this famous guy to do beards, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the guy he wanted. He battled like crazy with TNT about it, and they just said no, no, we're uh -huh. not doing it. And that's what uh -huh. hurt. That's what hurt us. Okay, because we had to bring somebody well, in that really didn't do beards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it like, and, and I mean, it was, I mean, I, I had a mustache, so that saved a little time. That helped. Right? So you yeah. just blend the beard in, yeah, and, and it, it didn't bother me at the time. The did you did you try to grow your own, or was there not enough oh, time? Oh, I, I didn't have time. A beard like that? Are you kidding? <laughs> would've never, it would have never been long enough. It's like five yeah. years? <laughs> five years of growth? Yeah, 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 maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the hat too. Um, he, Longstreet yeah. is, is it apparently known for wearing a wide brim hat like that. It, that's a little bit more of a later style. How did that come into the picture? Well, uh, it was the 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 costume guy, Mike Boyd, who I thought was great. You mm -hmm. know, really a great guy. Mm -hmm. um, lives down there in Victoria, Texas. He's got his own warehouse and stuff. And he said, you know, <laughs> you remember him, right? Bo? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And he says, you know, he says, they told me, ah, oh, we don't, all the reenactors got their own uniforms. You don't need to bring it. He goes, I'm going to bring mine anyway. And he, so he had like a hundred extra Confederate uniforms and like a hundred extra union uniforms. And, and, he said, I don't know. Nah, 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 nah. you, know, you, you know, you know, he was like, bro, I don't believe that when I see it kind of guy. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And no, that's what's great about it, too. Yeah. Right. He, he covers his bases and and he says, I, I, it's great. They got their own uniforms. We couldn't do this otherwise. You know, exactly. but he said, I used every single one of those reserve uniforms, blue and gray. Um like uh, production assistants who were in Pickett's charge or something, he put them in uniform. Okay. Right. Yep. Sure. And they'd have their radio and they'd be in the ranks there. Or You know what I mean? If it was even those guys, but you had to have them for whatever reason, you had to have the uniforms just in case of an emergency. Right. Or, or to fill in a few spots and pick his charge or something like that. And, um, you know, so that that was smart that he did that. He was he was really good. That guy. We um, used him on Rough Riders too. I remember uh, the suits were having a fit because they wanted to see your face, and they're like, "The hat, it's covering his face." Right. They were calling. They were well. The, calling. You know, the hat. You know, the hat didn't really cover my face. You just had to work it's the shadows. With it. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. And yeah. It, well, the shadow was fine though because it. It gave, first of all, you didn't get hit with direct light, you know. You right, right, right. Out, so you like weren't washed out. out, yeah. Yeah, and and it, and it gave a really great look, I thought. And, and I, also, No, that's the thing, is it I looks it great. Did, yeah, it's a great and hat. He said, he said, and I said, that's pretty big, but <sighs> when I put it on, I, it looked great. He says, you have a large hat size, seven and five eighths. Me too. You can get away with this. And he was right. Yeah, so uh, I mean, with me, so that you was gotta just, watch out about a hat being too small. It'll look silly. It, well, exactly. I have the same problem. I feel your pain. Um, so, so it, there was the wardrobe guy. He had that hat, and just it worked. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I thought so. Yeah. You know, you could buy uh, that hat. A local hat maker now uh, makes uh, the Long Street hat. That you can go into the store and get. <laughs> so, oh my God, you're kidding me! No, <laughs> no, and he does a really good job of it too. I've been tempted to buy it, but I put it on me, and it's just if I had the beard, it would and hair, you know, because I don't have I shave my head. So well, that's that's the other thing that Mike said. He said because you're going to look like a lion with all this yes. stuff going on, and I went, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. No, he Mike thought about it. He gave it a lot of thought. No, I thought I think it's it cool. I think and the hat's it wasn't cool. like a choice between this one or that one. I went, you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, now, so we got those out of the way. Uh, the the hat and the beard questions. Um, so when you get to uh, shooting, though, so you guys, you know, you have some shared scenes together and everything like that. Um, what, first of all, was it as hot as it looked? Yes. Yeah. So you guys were here all through the summer, basically. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, where did you end up staying? Were you in a hotel, or the, would you have trailers, or what? Well, I ended up. I they rented a house for me outside of town in a gated community, oh. 
oh, and then okay. I, I it was no fun. I, you know, I was yeah. isolated from everybody, so I moved into the Gettysburg Hotel. So okay, yeah, walking distance to several pubs and uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Tom? Where did you stay? Do you remember? I, um, well, I had gone up with my assistant Stevie, who's also in the movie, and uh, may he rest in peace. Yeah. Um, but he, uh, we went up there before the shooting. And just sort of snuck into town. I don't know, whatever. I, and I don't even remember where we stayed exactly, but it might have been the place I ended up staying during the shoot. But there was a hotel on the south end of town, at the other end of the Chambersburg. I mean, not, uh, not Chambersburg Pike. You know, Baltimore Pike. On Emmitsburg Road. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Going right. down towards Maryland. Gotcha. Emmitsburg yeah. Road. Yep. Mm -hmm. What was it? Emmitsburg Road. You got it. Emmitsburg Road. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But. It, but it was, the, I don't know whether that was the Ramada Inn or something like it's that. It's changed now. There's a quality in there yeah. now, uh, right, at, right on the battlefield. Like It's like basically the last building on that side of the street, if that's what you're talking um, about. No, I don't think it was that close. I think it was a little bit further down. Weren't you across from that little oh, 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 I know where. No, the, you're, you were staying at the Eisenhower. It's called the Eisenhower uh, Inn and Compl or Sports Complex or something like that. I, it, it's like oh. a it's like a standalone hotel in the middle of nowhere, right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, that's the. Uh, it's but now it, it's called the Eisenhower. They it must have changed the name. Maybe it looks yeah. like it might have been a Ramada at one point. Uh huh. Yeah. So okay. Um, so that's where you are. Yeah, and um, I, and I also decided that we would use because I went in there and checked all this stuff out. You know. Um, we were in town a couple of days, a few days and stuff, and and we met the the owner of the Farnsworth house, whose name escapes me. Um, I think Loring, Lauren, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, Lauren, yep, Schultz, and that's it, Lauren Schultz. And then his son was the bartender, or his son-in-law, I should say, okay, was the bartender in the bar there. So they had the restaurant, the bookstore, uh, the gallery, and the bar. Uh -huh. right? Restaurant, bookstore, gallery, bar. Yeah, all in that little complex on Baltimore Street. Yes. Yeah, still do. Yep. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and I said, Stevie, this is going to have to be the officers' club for the Army of Northern Virginia. <laughs> and still and is. we proclaimed that, and we put up a sign. I mean, the first week we were there, yeah. we had a sign, and then eventually that sign, I think, signed it. Yeah, uh, it's, it's hanging on the there. wall to this yeah. day. Yeah, it's still there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a lot of and, stuff there. Oh, yeah. And I mean, you know, and it got to the point where they go, listen, we'll close it to you guys, you know, on Friday, Saturday night. We'll close it to you, like private party kind of thing. Put a sign on, blah, blah, blah. And I go, yes, keep out the battlefield riffraff. Yes. <laughs> 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 He said, the only thing I ask is that the, that the rangers and the historians be allowed. I go, yes, we know all of them. <laughs> well, they're like our friends now. You know, yeah. yes, they're fine. Yeah. Oh, you know, I, I go, what if there's just three of us in here one night? I mean, you, what do you want to be, like alone? You know, like, yes, bring them in. Right. Yeah. He says, good, good. Yeah. Because they're my regular patrons, too. I said, yeah, yeah. You know, and they just played all of the old songs, Civil War songs. And kind of, it's on a constant, you know, it's red going around and around. Yeah. That yeah. Was, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've heard some so, uh, uh, stories from uh, Bo and uh, Patrick Gorman. Uh, you, you kind of uh, were like the leader of the confederate actors. Um, did you, uh, <laughs> they, were, they, were, they were telling me about swords that you got them all. Well, yeah, I, but I but I also had that for I had it for the Yankee characters too. Oh well, don't um, ruin it for them, Tom. Yeah, I had um, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I uh, but I had like because I, yeah, I know I did. You know, for for the Yankee characters, um, not all of them. I'm just the top. No, ones. and and then uh, uh, Kevin Conway, who played the Irish sergeant, I got a I got a little like figurine. Like a handmade figurine of a of a Yankee soldier that kind of looked like him, you know. Yeah, kind of looked like him in his uniform and stuff. And uh, um, I gave that to him, but I, the swords were for all the other guys. So, was, so what did you um, with the swords? Like, where'd you get that idea? And where did you get the sword? Are these reproductions uh, or? 
Well, yeah, they're reproductions, and they're all like it's the muskets and the swords are all reproductions and the bayonets. And, yeah, I don't know how much more of equipment, but they're made in India, and they're well made. But they're not horribly expensive, but they're well made. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they seem like the real thing almost, except the blades aren't sharpened. You'd have to do that on right, a, right on a honing stone or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and then you um, had them engraved. I had, it, it was, it was great. Everybody got a kick out of it and it kind of got us, you know, off on a great start. There it too. really did. Yeah. That was a great idea. Yeah. It was a great idea. And Ted Turner was thrilled to get his. Yeah. You got one for Ted. That's right. It yeah. Was awesome. He goes, oh my God, Jane, look at this. Look at this. Yeah. He was so pumped. Go, yeah. <laughs> did it have a pearl handle or something or? No, no. It was, it was like was a, a really a nice. Yeah. It was, a, it was a infantry. You know, tree the line sword. You yeah. know, it's like, uh, artillery was a little different, and, and then there's sabers for cavalry, right. etc. You know, but eh, um, then he, I think you were telling me that uh, you were instrumental in getting uh, Ted Turner to have his famous cameo as he uh, leads his men over the fence during Pickett's charge. Yes, I had. Uh, he has an island. Uh, I was living in you know, Beaufort, South Carolina, and he has an island off the coast there. And one of the guys told me his, his brother-in-law, like, ran the island for him and, you know, had a boat that he'd take groceries and supplies and stuff over and come back. There's no bridge there. And somehow or another, he got, um, I don't know, a dinner, got an early dinner. I was still light out and everything got organized. And I don't know how far before, but it, you know, I, I don't know how, how many months before it was. My wife and I went over there and had dinner um, with Ted and Jane, and we're at the dinner table, and he's he was all excited, and we're talking and eating and everything, and he's all excited about it, and so I could see he was just thrilled, you know, like a kid. He was, like, just so excited, and... and um, uh, you know, he'd read the book, I don't know, a couple times in the script, et cetera, et cetera. And so, and he said, in his excitement, he said, you know, you know, Berenger, I always wanted to die and pick its charge. <laughs> I said, say what? He said, I always wanted to die and pick its charge. I said, well, why don't you? <laughs> and he said, say what? Say what? I said, why don't you die and pick his charge? And now, at this point, a hand is hitting me under the table, the side of my leg. It's Jane. And I, and he goes, well, geez, you know, I mean, how, how do you do something like that? The hand hits me again. I, and I'm knocking the hand away under the table. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? And, and I said, well, I said, we just, all right, for example, we, we put you in a you know, as a colonel, you're leading a regiment of infantry. You're leading a charge across the, the open field towards the Emmitsburg, Emmitsburg Road and the Dutch fence there on the Emmitsburg Road. Right. And I said, yeah, you know, you're, as guys are starting to climb over it and everything, and you, you maybe, I don't know, get on the fence or right before you get on it, you you know, like, come on, boys, give them the cold steel. And get up a step, bang, you get shot. <laughs> right in my heart. <clears throat> And you got one line. Come on, boys, give him the cold steel. Yeah. So and and he goes, Whoa. I go, Yeah. <laughs> he goes, You think we can do this? And I said, well, Uh yeah. <laughs> you're the producer. I'm, I'm kind of the lead confederate. I think we can work this out. <laughs> it's your dog, Ted. Ted. It's yes, your dog, Ted. Beat, beat her hand away again. I, he says, I how long do you think this would take? I go, oh, day. He goes, that long? I go, well, no, look, you, here's, what, here's the deal. You'd have to fly, first of all, know what day we're shooting it. I said, secondly, you fly in the day before. We get you in your uniform. We give you a pistol, a sword, et cetera, blah, 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 right? right. And um, I said, let your beard grow, uh, like, for a week. You know, it doesn't have to be full beards like all right. these guys got and stuff, because you know, some didn't, but... I said, but it looks like you've been on the march from Virginia and haven't had time to shave. Just keep marching, 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 you know. Yep. And here you are going right into battle. I said, um, 
So that would be a great look. And I said, you're slender anyway, so perfect. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, and he said, we, I go, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get all that, taking care of the costume, we'll get your size and stuff. And I said, then you shoot your thing. And if you want to hang around another day, because I knew I like how impatient he kind of is. You know, he's yeah. always in a hurry and flying here and flying there. And it's always been like that. But he actually did stay three days. He had a hell of a time. He, he had a ball. <laughs> I remember, remember they, Jane they, riding horses uh, on set and into mm-hmm. the mess hall. Oh, so yep. she was here too. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, the, I th- what, the I think there was another story of uh, you guys are at dinner and she was just kind of enthralled uh, with how into it you guys are. Or something you remember? When- well, it was yeah. It was at, like the dinner was at um, what's that place? The stone, uh, the big the, Dobbin House. Dobbin House. Right? Dobbin House. Yeah, yeah, the one that built like the year of the revolution. Yep. And that's where the dinner was. And it was great and stuff. And so we're there and we're all like, you know, just, uh, we're singing, we're singing the rebel songs, like the Bonnie oh, Blue flag right. yeah. and, you know, and stuff like that. And, and Jane says to me, he said, boy, you guys are really, <laughs> you're really, I go, you know, I, I go, honestly, it was the same thing on platoon. Really? I go, Yeah. I said, you get a bunch of guys together, and they're doing a war film or a sports film. Yep. Look out. Yeah, it's boys yeah. down. Give a bunch yeah. of guys swords, guns, and horses and see what happens. Yeah. 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 It's boys town. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I would imagine. Wouldn't, oh, wouldn't know, but I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, I go, wow. I go, I, yeah. Well, I said, that was the it, South. Now. That was the South story. The North story was a little different. They were a little more boring. And you know what? I mean, I don't know who said it in <laughs> Gettysburg. They said it was the big. Uh, the the boring the big boring blue. They came in to the Farnsworth with their little you know with their oh I've got to read my script tonight or oh I have I'm reading this great novel and really I'll just have a nice tea non sweetened with a little you know I the they're lemon. like everybody well, was in and town then, and then was you got, you got have, Sam Elliott Sam Elliott would join us at the bar but that's because his his cavalry on the shot. first day it, they overlapped yeah, yeah. they yeah. overlapped us yeah. yeah. But yeah. but the South was fought, you know shot first. Well, Buford we was from Kentucky gone. anyway. We were gone when the blue got here, basically. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, and everybody was so disappointed. They're like, "Oh, these guys suck. <laughs> 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 they, they don't have much to say. So, like, can they you guys really just come back to hang out? They're not loud. They're not <laughs> boisterous. They're not. You know, they're just like you know. Really? Yeah. Oh, what a shame. And that was a bunch of people from Gettysburg told me this. Yeah. Well, that's I, you know what you're right, Bo. They did say that. I I, I heard that too. <laughs> I got some feedback on that. I totally forgotten about all that, but it's true. They did say that. I, well, go, Ooh, yeah, you know, oh. I love Jeff. <laughs> I love Jeff. Jeff Daniels. He's a great guy. But you know, oh, yeah. he, he's not the most exciting guy at a party. I'll tell right, you. Right. Okay. You know? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> very subdued, very serious. And quiet and you know, <laughs> and I think he set the temperament for the the whole for everybody whole else. Side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, right, because I mean, I guess besides Sam Elliott, uh, at the time he was the big star on the Union side, right? And, uh, he and yeah, and, and, and uh, C. Thomas Howell, they 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 had both been pretty known at that time. But as far as well, I'm trying to think of who else was on the Jeff. No, that's what I just I said. Mean, that was it. You yeah, know? Sam yeah. Elliott, Jeff, and yeah. C. Thomas Howell yeah. were the big hitters. That was over totally the, and so funny. I, I can say this now, but. When TNT wanted Jeff Daniels, I said, I, I was like, no way, man. He's a comedian. He's, you know, uh, Ron, please don't go there. This guy is, you know, he's just not, I, didn't, I, I don't think he's going to bring it, you know. And Ron, felt the, and Ron felt the same thing. You know, he felt the same way. He flew to Michigan and, and auditioned him before he would get, give a go. When he came back from Michigan, he was like, Bo. This guy is he's he's the he's yeah good. he's great he's terrific he's he, gonna he's gonna blow you away on this role and he did he was yeah, terrific he, did. he was fantastic yeah. yeah he was um you you mentioned in the the town and uh, you know what you've heard locals say and everything like that the, I mean to this day people who were here at that time love to tell stories of when the movie company came to town and all the actors were hanging out at the Farnsworth house and everything like that. Do you have any particular memories uh, yourself, Tom, of uh, any interactions, interesting people that you might have met who were locals? 
Let me get my yeah, let me get my cricket yes, sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm, you know, like I mean, Loring was interesting to me. You know, yeah, he was telling me that um, that his ancestors they were from there. You know, they were like Pennsylvania Dutch or something. Mm -hmm. But but he but he was from West Virginia, and he said so and so fought on the north, so and so fought for the south because it was a border state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where he was from originally. But it's, uh, uh, when we had we had Armistead's family come and visit. That's right, and uh, a descendant of Lee came to visit. Huh? huh. Uh, yep. And and then the, the the girl, the young girl, was probably I'm guessing around maybe nineteen, eighteen, nineteen, or something like that, with her mother, and. She was a direct descendant of Pocahontas. Wow. Really? And uh, and then Armistead as well. Pocahontas yeah. and Armistead. Yeah, they were from Virginia both. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And what, yeah, what did they do? They just came to visit uh, you guys? The, the well, they were, invited house, up. I, they were invited up by Ron, I think. Oh, okay. They had like a little lunch or something like that. I, you know. Yeah. And then, of course, yeah. Jeff came to visit and uh he jeff daniels shara oh jeff shara okay who now lives here right yes he's taking up right did you know that tom that he what he's taking up residence here he lives no here, i didn't know that yeah no i didn't know that full time yeah how often uh how often have you been up here since the movie Tom. Who, Bo? No, no, no. Bo, Bo's about been here for months. You've been there about a hundred times, haven't you, Bo? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, he I mean, could be considered battlefield riffraff at this point. <laughs> I, I know. You know, I came, I was only here three times before, uh, after the movie. And then I came back to, for the reunion. And then I started coming back. Right. Yeah. After the reunion 2018. Yes. Two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, well, that's where you first did this show, and you said, man, I have to keep coming back there to hang out with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I just, it's such a great little town. I love it here. The people are great, the, the town. So it's it's an awesome little forth. town. Yeah I, mean, yeah, I mean, I live in Texas, but I come back and forth. Like, yeah, a, yeah a you lot. actually come up here to be in the cold, whereas I'm asking cold, you yeah. to let me watch your house uh, down there in the warmth of Texas. Yeah, it's 75 in Houston today, <laughs> yeah. so... Um, <clears throat> okay, so w w during the shooting, um, you, you have all these battle scenes. I've always wondered, you know, how it, it looks so difficult to coordinate all of those people and all of those movements, camera movements. You have how many cameras, like say for uh, Pickett's Charge, I mean, they, what, do they have five cameras or something going or more than that? Do you remember anybody? Uh, well, they had, well, they had. Gosh, uh, I, I, I'm just, I'm kind of hard to four, remember, but they, five, they had, yeah, and, and they also the had helicopter. had the helicopter shots. The, the Dutch guy that was the DP, he, Case Van um, Alstrom, Case, yeah, yeah, Case, right, and he had. That was the first time I ever saw little helicopters, remote <laughs> helicopters with cameras in it. Yeah, Tom, I, mean, I kinda, thought that kind of like a drone now. It's right, it's right? like a drone now. But you think back, and the only thing I could think of was they're going to cut somebody's head off. <laughs> you know, this was a miniature helicopter that was very big. Yeah, because it had to hold a thirty-five millimeter camera, which is pretty heavy. Uh -huh. And they were flying right over the heads of people. And I thought, man, this could be a, a room of the Twilight Zone. <laughs> right, disaster. right, right, right. I, I just was just like cringing the whole time. And I because they're remote controlled. <laughs> yes. They're not. They're not man. No, right? they're remote controlled. And I thought, and with all the, the there were you know there were bombs going off from the ground that that shoot yeah, up yeah. the dust and the stuff. Yep. And I thought. This is a replay of the Twilight Zone in the in the 1980s. What are they doing? You know, <laughs> you can actually see in one of the shots. I can't remember if it's um, when it's flying. Well, it's flying over the artillery, all going yeah, off. Right. But I think it's as one of the cannon right near it blows. You can actually see it shake the yes. helicopter. 
Like the this the the shot actually shakes. The percussion, so, you know. Yeah. That's so, what I was afraid of. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah, I don't blame you. Like it just but gets. The, Ron didn't care. He's like, so what if we lose some heads? Look at the shot we're gonna get. <laughs> right. We should be thousands more. So yeah. So they they got to coordinate all that stuff now. Now Tom, like while uh, the pickets charge stuff is going on, and you have those conversations with. Uh, um, Alexander and and Pickett and and all that. Um, are they? Do they film those? They, they film those separate from all the big action, obviously. But I mean, do they film them on even the same day or are those separate days that you come in? Because I always thought, uh, you know, the editing together a battle scene with all these different storylines playing out during the battle has got to be really tough, and shooting wise and all that. Go ahead. Well, I can say the scene with uh, Alexander, uh, Colonel Alexander was like, I have one right before the battle. And I think in the background, you see a couple of cannons yeah. sort of being unlimbered yes. or something like that, you know. Um, and I I tell him, give him the more or less the, you know, the plan, the orders. Um, and then I come back again in the middle of the bombardment. Yes. Uh, where we're yelling back and forth to each other. And yeah, I guess you had to see some cannons fire back there. Yeah. Because we certainly had the noise. I mean, why not? Mm-hmm. Right. So they must have been firing, as oh, I recall. Yeah. yeah. Um, they were. Those. Yeah. Those were. Um, the seventh they, day. I, they, well, they're before the charge, the infantry charge. Yeah. So, and there's no reason for me to go out there again after, because I say, you know, once they pass you, cease fire. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, you don't want to fire on your own men. Right. But, um, you know, give it everything you got. And then I'm there and he's going, we can't, we're having trouble getting the caissons up with the end. Yeah, yeah so I think that's where you're, aren't you going like, damn, damn. Like, you're just getting frustrated. Yeah. yeah. That's one of my favorite deliveries yeah. of the word, damn. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I don't because you could just right, well, you could just tell how frankly, frustrated. My, frankly, my dear, I don't give it. <laughs> <laughs> it's second to Same that. War, different movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so, uh, how long were you here for, Tom, to film your part? Were you here uh, the whole time, or I think it was six weeks, and six weeks. I stayed. Maybe an extra week. Stevie and I stayed because I wanted to watch the the cavalry right. stuff with Sam Elliott's cavalry. Um, you know, on the first day of battle, mm-hmm. the okay. opening of the battle. Yeah. So you were around for that. I saw. Yeah, I saw. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some of the more famous scenes that I know um, among the fans uh, always is made a reference to um, are the scenes with Hood. Uh, you know, this should have gone around to the right at the hospital and all that. Um, uh, the how, how, well, do, go ahead, just give me some memories of that working with uh, Patrick Gorman in those scenes because he's been on the show. And well, it, you know, I think there was a, a nice relationship between Hood and Longstreet. It had been, you know, from the beginning of the war up, up until then and everything, and. But Longstreet himself is frustrated because he wanted to go around to the right, and we see him telling that to Lee. And I think he just kind of loses it there when when Hood keeps talking and complaining and you know and, and gesticulating and whatnot. And he and he says, "Listen, I have talked to the commanding general three times about this, and he said no." Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so in military terms that's end of argument. Right. I said, you have your orders. Do it. Get your men. Well, I do it under protest. Fine. Just do it. <laughs> right. Who you cares know? if you're doing it? And under I protest. mean, it's not, I'm. I'm not mad at him. I'm. I'm as frustrated as he is. Sure. Here we are in this situation that's concerning both of us. You know, um, doomed, yeah. tac- tactically and and also, yeah, you know, strategically. And so I, I, it's it's. Uh, I'm as frustrated as he is. Yeah. But I have to take my orders and he has to take mine. So that's the way it works. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, now, I, my favorite thing about uh, movies is the behind the scenes stuff, especially bloopers, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know, gaffes or whatever. Uh, so, do you have any memories of those? Any good uh, behind the scenes uh, <laughs> flubs or anything that you could think of? 
That, that cost the production a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, that wasted a lot of film. That, I mean, when you're shooting 35, so you, when you're, you've got a technocrane that follows me from Lee's tent down a hill to Longstreet's tent with all of his generals standing there, and I walk up to say, one, line, <laughs> and everybody's looking cross-eyed at me. <laughs> <laughs> And why are they looking cross-eyed at you? <laughs> when, oh, that was so funny. I went, General, <laughs> and I'm looking at everybody and go, Lee, we'd like to see you. And yeah. Ron Maxwell, cut! <laughs> what the hell? What? What is that? What is that? Like, they're, making, they're making faces at me. <laughs> you know, they, you have uh, this technocrane that, that goes up the hill first because you've you got this, these horses running by troops. Oh, going from one side, then this, you know, these these prisoners being marched to the rear, right? Yeah. <laughs> Mule teams pulling ammo wagons. There's ammo another wagon. one. Yeah. Try turning one of those around. Right. <laughs> How long is that going to take? Turn that thing around and go back, and then turn it around again to go do the scene over. Right. <laughs> yeah. Big pain in the butt. Oh, that was a huge. Oh scene. yeah. Huge scene to mess up on, especially with I think one line. So right, yeah, that was. Uh, and, and what was the line? Do you remember what the line was supposed to be? General Lee would like to speak with so you. So you go to General Longstreet. You <laughs> no. say General Longstreet. General, General Lee Longstreet. Would, yeah. General Longstreet. General Lee would like to see you in his quarters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what couldn't you yeah. get about that? Uh, Tom mm. making faces at me. <laughs> no, making, <laughs> that's what Bo declared to the press. But the, the truth is, he just went up. He, he wasn't focused, and he just went up on his line. And, I said, and yeah. Then, I and think then, I said, as, General as Lee. Those things, as yeah. those things, as they often do, just keep getting worse. Yeah. yeah. And 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 then you hear cut. It's Ron. You can't see him. We can't see him. He's up in a crane somewhere, like behind us or some shit. And it's like we're over. I don't know. And it says cut. Bo, what the hell is the matter with you? Right. And goes. I'm, I'm sorry, Ron. We'll, we'll get again. All right. All right. Back to one. But well, I said, I, my response all was... All the Yankee prisoners got to be marched 100 <laughs> yards back to where they started. The mule team has to turn around and go uh, back, you know. <laughs> then they got to turn around, face forward, and some Confederate <laughs> troops moving up this way and that. And then all the, the generals are like, oh, okay. They're all in the hot sun. They're watching Major Sorrell do the briefing. And it's like, we do it again. And then he says... Then you said something like... I called you General Lee. Major Taylor. Oh, God. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he says his own name as the announcer. <laughs> I am Major Taylor. Taylor Major Taylor. Taylor. You know, uh, and uh, now Lee it's would... like, now it is like, God, all right, back to one. Jesus, right? <laughs> Everybody starts rumbling back. This takes time. Yep. This is the big crane shot of the movie. And it was a wonder. It was all a wonder, you know. One and shot, then, yeah. And then we do it again. Yeah. <laughs> then we it's all in one shot too. You know, no cuts, nothing. Gotta get this thing right. Uh -huh. And and then <laughs> and then he comes in the third time and he looks at me and he starts laughing. And I go, Oh, for God's <laughs> sakes. <laughs> <laughs> that's when uh yeah, that's when Ron said Bo, you're killing me. <laughs> so this is why this is so this is why when when someone messes up in these bloopers, they always say sorry because it's all these people have to go back to one. Oh yeah. Yep. So it's a big. It's you're, yeah. You're making everybody do it all over again. And when you're shooting 35, it's really expensive. Sure. Well, yeah. that's the other thing because how how many minutes is a roll of 35 millimeter film? Uh, let's see. Is Shoot, it like I 10. Don't remember? Um, I don't. Remember. 12. It's not a lot. It's not a lot. No. How about uh, horses? You're you're dealing with a lot of horses in this movie. Uh, anybody okay. take a spill or anything like that? Uh, horses are the best actors on the on the set. Yeah, <laughs> they, they yeah. hit their mark every time. <laughs> right, <laughs> they run when they're supposed to. We had usually. one one incident. Uh, what was the guy Applegate? Uh, what was his name? Uh, his first name, Tom. Apple. Oh, really? 
Who 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 who? Royce Apple. Oh, Royce. God rest his Royce. soul. Royce he Applegate. Was General uh, Kemper. One of my brigade commanders. Yeah, General right. Kemper. Yeah, yeah. And he yeah. was riding up to camp. He was not a horseman. Right. And he's riding up to camp, and the saddle wasn't cinched well enough. Ooh. And as he's riding well, that could towards happen to anybody. us. I've seen, yeah, I saw that happen on a couple of times on Hatfields and McCoys. I was furious, boy. Um, oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. man. That's, can, it, it's it's, a, it's amazing that he wasn't stepped on. But you could just see him riding towards us, and all of a sudden, he just mm. starts slowly <laughs> going over, yep. over, 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 mm. and a gallop, yep. you know. And mm -hmm. uh, he wound up. Uh, under the horse but didn't get stepped oh really oh, yeah. so he went right off that was here's that was one here's thing. one for you here's one for you there's this scene where i'm at the hospital a hood's in there in surgery and i i don't know whether it's i've just gone in to see him or or right before i i go, I go in to see him in a barn one of those pennsylvania dutch barns that's mm. the hospital mm -hmm. right and um, yeah, in the yard are all these amputees and there's body parts being, you know, arms and legs and stuff being dumped into a big container, et cetera, et cetera. There was a team of mules. I guess this was an ambulance, right? Had a little mm -hmm. cover over it for the sun and it's like a buckboard with mules as to use as a, a field ambulance. That's sitting over there empty. All of a sudden, these explosions go off. It's like Union artillery or something from well, Pickett's char or, or the second day of battle or something like that. I don't know. And and anyway, they, all these explosions go off. They're coming from Little Round Top or something. Okay. And and um, uh, they're like rockets and things like bursting and stuff. The mules go crazy. <laughs> They start running for this group of guys. These are like real amputees. They got. Oh. They're laying in, in oh, this no. yard, and this mule team and buckboard. Oh, these six mules in this buckboard are heading for them. And this one guy, like the, uh, not the head of the, head of the of the Wranglers, but kind of the, I don't know, the big second number two guy. Butch was his name. Remember him, Bo? Yep. I sure do. Butch. Yeah, I did a couple of films and with him. Yeah, really nice guy. He looked he looked kind of like a big ex uh, middle linebacker or uh -huh. something. You know, kind of like Dick Butkus or something. Yeah, right? <laughs> that's right. And, and he saw this, saw those mules bolt after this explosion, and they were running right for the guys. And he ran and did a rolling block underneath them. What? Oh. Wow. Wow. Which, yeah. All these mules like just tripped over him. Yeah, really? I did not yep. know that one. I didn't know that. Oh, uh, yeah. Story. Yep. And the wagon, I think, turned over or something. But it's hmm. like he didn't get hurt. <laughs> oh, jeez. All so the tight. mules were fine. None of them broke a leg or anything. Right? None yeah. of the guys, the, the uh, Confederate amputees, none of them got hurt. Hmm. And... He gets up and dusts himself off, and I go, that was smashing bush. That was just incredible. <laughs> I wow. No, it was. It was one of the coolest things I ever saw. Yeah, that I'm, sounds I'm awesome. Wow. Yeah. So yep. so uh, all of you guys kept to your saddles? You didn't uh, fall off or anything? Mm -hmm. Bo, you stayed on? I, Tom? My horse my horse slipped down in a shot. It's like, like one take I did with Colonel Alexander. I come riding up, and, and he's there, and he's being shot in profile. He's stationary looking through his binoculars. Mm. And I'm supposed to roll up and be right next to him, but slightly behind just so the camera can see him, see both of us in profile. Right. So I come rolling up, and my horse slips in the early morning dew which yeah is on the grass and that grass was deep and he just slips but but he kept his it footing it's like nope no he went down on his side but it was like slow motion the horse didn't get hurt i kind of leaped off sideways i was fine and nothing happened oh yeah because there is a, there is a... of, i went on the shot i went out of frame so they had that for outtakes uh-huh <laughs> There is a uh, there is a shot though I think that made it into the final cut where your foot or your horse seems to 
trip a bit, but nobody goes down. You keep, you know, he keeps his footing and you keep in the saddle. But I thought it was that shot, but mm. I no, guess not. No, no, that, no. This is one where I'm going up and I and I'm coming to a stop, and he just happened to slip in that. Oh, in that, oh, oh. The dew, the grass. Gotcha, you know, the grass gotcha. Was, the grass was like not knee high, but you know, over ankle high. What was anyway? Yeah. At, at, yeah, and and he and I just fell out of frame, which they put in the outtakes, you know. And like, speaking of outtakes, um, what was the prank you pulled on uh, the head honchos uh, with the dailies? Yeah, we did this scene. I don't know if you were there, Bo. You might have been. It was uh, I come riding up with my staff to Lee's staff, so you two must have been there, you and Marshall, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And and I said, General Lee, General Lee. Pickett's men have broken through, have broken through the Yankee Center. I said, they're in retreat. Jeb Stewart's, Jeb Stewart's cavalry are rounding up prisoners in the rear. It's like, <laughs> it's it's on to Washington. <laughs> and Lincoln will be my prisoner. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, and you know, and he's, that's very good, General. Very good, very good. Right? <laughs> very well. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we sent that to you know, the people at, at TNT for them to see. They wanted to see all the dailies every day. So we sent that. Yeah. I have a picture. The, the, some one of the like, Go ahead. The South won the Battle of Gettysburg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've rewritten it. <laughs> oh, God. There's somebody took a pic, one of the photographers. I, I brought him over and I took my sword. And Marty's sitting on his horse, we're just waiting for a take, you know, and, and I'm behind him on my horse, and I, and I have this picture of me thrusting a sword in his back, you know, and he's just sitting there, like, daydreaming, and I've got this, I'm like, my sword is an inch from his back, and I've got this, like, I'm yelling, you know, ah, you know. <laughs> I've got to dig that up somewhere. Yeah, hilarious. yeah. I showed it to Marty. He could not stop laughing. He thought it was so funny. You need to put that in the Farnsworth house. I know. I need yes. To, I need yep. to dig through. You need to donate some pictures. stuff to the Farnsworth house. I have a lot the of The Farnsworth photos. Museum. The Farnsworth Museum. Oh, the museum. They've got a museum Kidding. there now. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. They yeah, have a house. memorabilia yeah. collection that can rival John John's, which I plan yeah. to steal one day. Because he just yeah. has his in his basement. I know. Yeah. yeah. For his and, own personal yeah. little weirdness. Yeah, we're just going to distract <laughs> him and go in and steal it all. <laughs> <laughs> we all know John John. He's a, he's a, he's a good guy. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, so, um, so uh, having played Longstreet, uh, it, it, would you say that's one of your favorite roles? or? <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I was just thrilled to be in it, you know, as an American. I It was an important story, and um, and I knew it would be fun, yeah. for God's sakes. Yeah. Yeah. And it was. It was. And memorable. And, and it, I mean, to have been there, like, just the Pickett's Charge thing it was like, I had, I must have had 12 or 13 people visiting to watch that. Mm. Oh, same here. I did too. New York, D.C., and South Carolina yeah. all came in you know, to watch. And that, they were, they said, oh, my God, that's incredible. You know, they were taking pictures. I said, go up that, that's electrician's ladder. There's nobody using it. Go ahead, get up there and film it, you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, great, you know. Yeah. And there were a couple of, uh, another interesting thing we talked about was um, uh, An Occasional Hell, which is a movie that he, the, you, Bo and Stephen Lang made together a um, few and years Robert later. Dobby. And Robert Dobby. That's Dobby. right, yes. <laughs> Don Davi. <laughs> <laughs> Who a lot of you yes. might remember him as one of the uh, Fratelli brothers in uh, The Goonies. A lot of my yep. generation would That's remember right. him as uh, that. Was it Fratelli? Yeah, Fratelli. Um, and so uh, the, the interesting thing about that movie <clears throat> is it's a murder mystery. And right in the beginning, Stephen Lang gets murdered uh, with a musket. And, uh, you know, and then so that got me thinking, well, the three you guys are in this movie. There must be some kind of weird connection, connection to Gettysburg <laughs> or somehow this is like related in some way. Is it? No, but no. we certainly recognize a musket. <laughs> and the, the, the Civil like War like. history. <laughs> yeah. when you're with Civil War vintage, yes. Yeah. Right, right. And wasn't the character that <laughs> right. was uh, the, the, the dead guy was it, the it was Civil a buff. War buff? Buff, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, but there were there. I don't know. There was like one scene where he picks up the woman, his mistress, and he puts on a kepi. <laughs> And I'm like I, it just doesn't make. I, I I don't know. And I'm like it's got to be like a, a tip of the hat to to their Gettysburg connection or something. I don't know. But also, I, uh, go I, ahead, Tom. No, I don't think so. No, no, no. It was no, just a coincidence. That was one of the first ones that you. Is that one of the first movie you produced? Yeah. When you did first core endeavors. Or, or yeah. Whatever? yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's that. Okay, that was another thing I noticed right at the beginning. A first core endeavor. Was it endeavors yeah. or productions? What was it, Tom? Endeavors. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah, that was another thing I noticed. Was yeah. Which, by the way, means you tried. <laughs> 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 it's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would you do it. You tried. <laughs> you tried to do that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, Another scene in there with Bo, Robert, Davi, and myself. Oh my God! It's like it's it was like uh, 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 what deja deja vu. Yeah, and and and, and Bo starts laughing, right? And Davi and I already have a problem with that because Davi and I cannot work together, right? Right. And, yeah, and Jeffrey Jones and I cannot work together. <laughs> It's not because they're 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 not good actors. No. It's just that we can't keep a straight face. Oh we start my God. laughing. It's unstoppable. The wow. director throws his hands in the air. The sound guy goes throws his his yep. earmuffs down on the floor. It's like, <laughs> yep, just can't get through the scene. Don't have enough discipline uh, or control to, to keep from doing it. I, <laughs> and here we got Davi and Bo and I in yeah. the same scene. Oh yeah. man, I laughed at, in that movie. I laughed so much, so much. <laughs> Oh, that was a lot. So much fun. Yeah. There, yeah. The, the had, scene you're talking about is outside of the victim's wife's house in the front. House, yeah, yeah, on the front like lawn. On the corner, at the corner of the house. Yeah. I found this so, movie. I yeah. found it on YouTube. So anybody that wants to go and watch it, that's the scene that they're talking about. It's actually, I enjoyed it. It's, it's a good know, little movie. Yeah, yeah. It, but it's 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 just it, 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 and oh, Bo, that's the one where the writer we said you have got. To solve this thing is like a Chinese puzzle gone awry. Yes, right? <laughs> like a Rubik's cube that can a Rubik's cube that could never be solved. And I and I said, you, I, I, this is and Dobby, Dobby, like read the book. He as every time he had time off, he was going over it, going over it, trying to solve the mystery. Right? Yeah, solve the mystery of the mystery. Yeah, and and um, and he says we got to have the writer. Well, the writer came in with his wife. Like maybe his kid or something, and he enjoyed Charleston and the and the nice restaurants and all that. But I think I think he he just he couldn't do it. Yeah. He couldn't solve his own his own story. <laughs> and he said, "I'm just burnt out." That's, That's what he told the director. I'm burnt out. I can't do it. You just don't want to hear that from a writer when you're in, in the, the middle, middle of a movie. movie. Yeah, <laughs> I just can't. I give up. I can't do it. I'm burnt out. Well, you know, I I'm trying from going to remember to the restaurants though. <laughs> yeah, the great restaurants. Oh, I'm trying to remember what the end of the movie was. I don't. Rem I can't remember how it ended. How did it end? Who? Uh, oh, it was the 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 redneck guy that killed him. Yeah. But why? And 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 put him in the septic tank or something. Yeah. Put the girl in the in the septic tank. Yeah. Yes. I, was, uh, I don't yeah. know. It was weird. You, you, ladies and gentlemen, you just got to go and watch it. And, oh, and, it's fun. Yeah. It's fun. And Tom's great in it. Tom's well, really the, good. You all are great in it. And, and it's it's fun to watch the three of you together in a movie that's not Gettysburg. Because, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just an well, it's interesting I, little thing. Yeah. I, I remember one scene, Mike, in a coffee shop. And and Davi's, like, talking to oh. me. And I'm, I'm looking away or down at my coffee and a donut. Yes. And yes, I remember. Just, yeah. I'm like just picking off little pieces of my donut and eating them because I can't look them in the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> when I have a line, I say it to the donut. <laughs> what is it about him that cracks you up so much? Oh, gosh. <laughs> what is there? Can you say? Can that? you say what it is? <laughs> Don Davi. Uh, mm. I had I had lunch with him. Not long ago at uh, Jerry's famous deli. That's where he holds court these days, or did oh, before. Was it New York, L.A., L.A. Yeah, but uh, oh, well, man. tell him, tell him not to watch that movie, or I'll go crazy. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> you know he's doing uh you know what he's doing now more than acting is uh frank sinatra oh yes yes and he's good yes he tours let me tell you, me tell you he sang opera for me once mm -hmm. I, I, w I was like what yeah mm -hmm. I, I mean, i'm sitting there and he's singing an aria and i said my god that's beautiful what you're in italian right mm -hmm. and I, I said what jesus are you he says no i trained as an opera singer when i was a kid i went you're shitting me mm. that's incredible you know he's mm -hmm. a huge i mean i'm wondering if he's ever done it in a movie the goonies good he, I mean, oh, it was it? Oh, he did. Yeah, he oh, didn't do it okay. seriously. It was just one little part where yeah. they kidnap the kid and he starts singing opera in the car. But yeah, I mean, he, he yeah, and he's good. He's really mm. talented, very talented. Yeah. Uh, so, but you can't tell me what 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 cracks you up about him. It's uh, top secret. No, it's not any one thing. It's just uh, it's, it's just, just like him. that that unspeakable uh, thing that people have <laughs> <laughs> between them. You know, they just start laughing when they see each other. Another uh, great one, uh, Tom, is, uh, and I got to mention, this was Teddy Roosevelt in uh, The Rough Riders. Did you have a great story about the editor wondering where you are in the film? Yeah, um, she was in L.A. and the, the, and the film went back, you know, um, and then... Uh, she was, you know, doing the assembly, what they call the assembly. It's sort of like a first word. Been working on it. So when I finally come out, which it's, we're getting, it's like the final print, I guess. So I come out to do the sound work and um, I'm going to get on there and you know, say hi to Millie, as you know. And then, and then he, he walks back in the sound booth and then I hear the mic come on and it's the woman sound editor. And she says, Tom, I'm, I'm so and so the, the, the sound editor of the film. I go, Oh, nice to meet you. And she says, um, uh, I have to tell you something that, uh, I, I was doing the, the first assemblies on this and things. And I, finally, I asked John, I said, John, where is Berenger in this? In this? Isn't he supposed to be in this? And he says, he's Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> <Okay. laughs> but it is. I mean, it is. It's not what we're used to seeing you doing. Reflection on you. Yep. <laughs> Did you wear a ma uh, teeth piece for that? Didn't you have a different teeth? Yeah, I had. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah I mean, it's a fantastic his, job. God. His teeth. His teeth look like ice cubes. All, all in a perfect row. Yeah. You know, that's like right. Square ice cubes. Yeah. Where they look in the tray. Yeah, he did have some big chompers. But no, that was, and, and you said that was pretty exhausting doing that. Because he's exhausted. Yeah. High energy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But I think that's what's so great about seeing you do it is because he's, he's like way out there compared to a lot of the other roles that we're used to seeing you in. You know, you're always kind of like this calm, cool, collected kind of guy who can like, kind of go nuts once in a while. But like, you know, you're you're like Teddy Roosevelt is always on, and that's mm -hmm. got to be hard. Mm -hmm. And and you also, when I read something, was the funniest president we ever had. And I believe that if you see some of the stuff he says. It just yeah, yeah, it was funny. Yeah, yeah no, it was a great job. Yeah. It was a great job uh, in that movie. Um, so, all right, we've got some questions from our listeners. Um, I'm going to get to uh, some of them here. Uh, we've cut, we've touched on a few, so I'm just going to go through these here, like uh, like Brian Butler's, for example. Brian Butler says, "Hey Matt, new member here on Patreon. Thank you, Brian. Uh, first off, even though a union guy, or yeah, even though a union guy myself, Mr. Berenger's portrayal of Longstreet had me pulling for the Rebs. So my question is, Mr. Berenger, in your portrayal." It seems that the general had an underlying sense of sadness about him. What did you draw on to convey that sadness? I'm a big fan. Thank you. Well, that was, um, I, I think there's some mention from Captain Gouri on that, you know. Uh, it's the only time you hear it. But, yeah, he's carrying his weight around that he didn't have, probably at the beginning of the war. But um, in the winter of winter of 62 and they would have been in stand down the armies didn't fight you know except right. at fredericksburg 
but but the winter of 62 uh in the, back in richmond and the scarlet fever epidemic hit and three of his four children died so he was never quite as folksy and so he's friendly with his men and all that but he just wasn't quite as outgoing after that mm -hmm. yeah yeah um so uh, let's see here. Another question is from Mike Lentz. He says, I was raised in Colorado. and My question has a Civil War connection, but not a Gettysburg one. In the TNT miniseries Into the West, you play Colonel John Shivington. How did you prepare for that role, and what are your thoughts on such a controversial figure? Well, what I read about him, I mean, he was a preacher, which is kind of strange. Mm -hmm. um, and then he formed a regiment of volunteer cavalry for the union in Colorado and they did fight in some, you know, smaller skirmishing type battles down in New Mexico, Arizona in that area. Mm -hmm. Um, when the Indian wars start after the civil war, uh, he goes down attacks a, um, Cheyenne village, I believe it was Northern Cheyenne. And, um, uh, they they were at peace. They had a flag. They were even flying the you know the, the stars and stripes up up, up front of the teepees, you know, and mm -hmm. attacks this village and just slaughters them. And yeah. it was just horrible, you know. Was that was that Black out, Kettle's village? Out of control. What was that Black Kettle's village? That Shivington? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, I, and and it was just they're just out of control. He, you know, he's out of control, and his men were just undisciplined. You know, mm, yeah. beyond belief. You know, I mean, it, it, it's a sorry, a sorry mark on you know American history. How, but how do you do? How do you do that though? Where you, where you play someone like that, um, and you got to play it, you know, to the hilt like, well, if you're going to do your job right. So, what are you drawing to be someone like that? I, I, I don't know. It's just any of the rigid or hatefulness part of your own personality you know sure we all got we all got it yeah yeah <laughs> yeah um okay rich snyder asks um he says have long been a fan of mr Barringer, especially as historical films uh was he offered the role of longstreet again in gods and generals and he wishes you well well i wish him well <laughs> <laughs> you hear you hear that, uh, Rich? Yeah, I mean, I, I just, what, I mean, he shows up in like three scenes in the background. I mean, it's like, what's the point, kind of? Um, I, you know, it's like, did he just disappear in the first part of the war before Gettysburg? Right, um, right. Like he so. didn't come yeah. into his own until Gettysburg. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I go, what's the point of this? You know, and and, and it's like. If you want to make it about Stonewall Jackson, make it about Stonewall Jackson. Yeah. You know, not try to do everything and civilian characters and this and that stuff. Not necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Get, get to it quick. And don't get, you know, the whole VMI and all that sort of stuff. You know, although Jackson and his wife, I, you know, I think are interesting, but uh, um, don't get too. Yeah. 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 Too uh, spread out. Right. Right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, and they wouldn't yeah. have paid me. They wouldn't pay. They would, I would have got like screen uh, sag minimum or something like what the hell is this? You know? So you don't uh -uh. think if you had taken it, they would have made the role bigger? No, no, no. There wasn't time. Yeah. Okay. There wasn't time. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it is kind of disappointing how little time Longstreet gets in that part because he did play a role in a lot of those pre. I mean, all of those Gettysburg. Well, not not Chancellorsville, but otherwise, you know, it was a big deal. So, yeah. but whatever. Yeah, you're right. They wanted to do Jackson. Um, okay, Joe Valicenti says two scenes have always stood out: the conversation between Longstreet and Fremantle, and the last conversation between Longstreet and Harrison. Both scenes have Longstreet point out the harsh reality of first the war and Southern cause itself, and then the Confederate Army's last ditch effort to win the Battle of Gettysburg. How did you keep yourself somber to show Longstreet's most well known demeanor and yet deliver words which were so meaningful? and could spark a uh, significant emotion in most people. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's gotten, yeah. It's one I, of the, how did I keep myself somber? Well, I don't, I mean, I mean, he's sort of a somber guy anyway, particularly yeah. at this point, you know, in time, but, um, 
I, I oh God, what do? It, it, the, okay, those are monologues like you'd have in the theater. Uh-huh. All right, it's yeah. a long monologue. You're, you're, you know, you're not there alone. The person you're talking to is your audience, obviously. Um, but it, it, they do kind of seem somewhat a little bit of a reverie, you know, kind of thinking out loud to yourself sort of thing. What the, those scenes are, are basically the writer trying to get all this stuff out. Okay. Yeah, it's exposition. Mm-hmm. Exposition. Yeah. Which has to be acted. Yeah. Not just information, you know, like sounding like a an auditor or something, you know. But but so it, 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 they're, they're they're tough scenes to do because of that, you know. And they're very very theatrical, like Shakespeare is loaded with. Yes, you know, Hamlet to be or not to be, talking to himself, you know. Um, the prologue of the guy in the beginning of uh, you know, of. Um, Henry the Henry the Fourth, you know, or something. It's um, yeah, it's uh, Richard the thir- uh, Richard the Third in his first scene monologue, talking about what has happened in the English uh, War of Roses and all that, and how bitter he is, and how he's kind of out of work in a way because he's a soldier, mm-hmm. and he's also disfigured with a hunchback. Um, but you get a ton of information in those scenes, and if you can act them well, great. You know, if not, ooh, you die. <laughs> yeah, but. Um, but it, but that's what they're about. It's the writer trying to tell you what's going on. Here, right. You know. Yes. Yeah. The, those and those conversations. And trying to do it in as economical way as possible without having a hundred extra scenes to, to show it. To show it. Yeah. yeah th- those conversations would not have happened. I mean, Fremantle would have known everything about yeah. the military you were sa- that procedure. You were saying, yeah. yeah. He would have known all that. And Harrison also would have probably known that as soon as they come out of the trees, solid shot. And then, you know, it, it, you know, so yeah. Uh, but that's uh-huh. for the sake of the audience. Right. Uh, same with Buster. Buster Kilrain is the author's voice. He's a completely made up character and yep. just, uh, yeah. Like another exposition guy. Uh, let's see here. Stephen Byer says, looking back, what would you have done differently in your portrayal of Longstreet? Hmm. What would I have done differently? Yes. Not, nothing. Nothing. All right. That's an easy answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Alex Snow asks, in the movie Looking for Mr. Goodbar, in some of the bar scenes, did you already know how to boogie? Or were you a pretty good disco dancer at the time? <laughs> I, I, I was a pretty good disco dancer because I it started down there in Miami and also like in Puerto Rico and stuff. And I had a Puerto Rican girlfriend, so we were down in salsa and all that kind of okay. stuff. Okay. Before I got up to New York, you know. So, I, you know, it, it, yeah. And then, you know, um, yeah. So there yeah. you go. I heard a rumor you were actually up for the role uh, that John Travolta got in uh, Saturday Night Fever. Is that correct? No. Oh, I no. just I just made that up. That's <laughs> <laughs> it was between him and John. I never heard of it until it came out. Yeah. Okay. Uh Alex Snow also has uh, another question about Hatfields and McCoys. You did very well in the character of Jim Vance that I loathe that particular character every time I think of or see that movie. So he's just that's not a question. I'm sorry, he's just telling you, great job. You made him hateable. <laughs> I guess that's what is he's that saying. A question no, it's is a, he's just no. It was a compliment. It was a compliment. Okay, was a compliment. Uh-huh. Uh, okay, Ollie. If someone today were to ask you about General James Longstreet, how would you characterize him based on your experiences portraying him? Uh, I I would think he was like very very solid general. You know, I mean, yes, he had a West Point background, but that doesn't always mean everything. He. Um, had experience in the Mexican War, uh, you know, personally been wounded in, in attacks and charges and things, you know, right there in Chapultepec and stuff, and in the Civil War too. He, mm-hmm. he, got, he got shot in the wilderness, which was Jackson did, coming back to his own lines mm-hmm. by his own men. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A year later, they like doing history that in the Confederate it. Army. History repeats itself. Yep. Yeah, and. Um, uh, he, I don't know. He, he was a good guy at logistics and communications and stuff like that, which is an important part of an army. We're moving an army. That's why we always liked him. And I, I, I think that 
probably Jefferson Davis should have had him go out and replace Bragg as commander of the army in the West. Yeah. And he did personally win that battle. I mean, he won that battle at uh, Chickamauga. Chickamauga. Yeah. yeah. Counter, by counterattacking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and he wouldn't, he would have been 10 times what Bragg was. Yeah. But I don't think Lee wanted to lose him either. You know? No, no, he was a solid well, guy. I mean, you get enough generals get killed, you start getting scared. You're like, geez, what am I? Who am I going to replace them with? I don't. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's, like, it's not. You know, and like Hood is a great example too, because Hood was brave, but I don't know if he should have been commanding more than a brigade or something. You know, hmm. maybe know. it may be a division, but he shouldn't have been commanding a corps or an army. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe by that point, Eric's shaking his head. What are you saying, Eric? You agree or disagree? Oh no, I'm I'm fully agreeing. Hood was a great brigade commander, pretty decent division commander, and an awful army commander. <laughs> okay, oh. there you go. <laughs> wow, <laughs> just like horrifyingly bad. If you look at Franklin and the whole yep. uh, Nashville, Nashville campaign, Franklin and Nashville, oh, just yep. awful. <laughs> wow! <laughs> All right, personally responsible for the death of the Army of Tennessee. There you go. Yeah. There you go, Eric. Yep. The producer uh, concurs. Dropping the gavel on that one. There. Yep. There you have it, folks. You you have a really good grasp of history, Tom. Like when we were talking on the phone, you were jumping all over the place from different periods of time and everything like that. I, I'm assuming uh, history is uh, an interest of yours. Huge. Absolutely. Yep. I also hear that you have a big, or, or did, or do have a big uh, collection of uh, Civil War memorabilia. No, it's all gone. All gone. Okay. Yeah. What yeah. what did you have? He had his own well, little museum. Oh, that's <laughs> did you really? Okay, like I think the three. Okay, okay. Maybe the three best examples would be. I don't know. I had Washington, George Washington, as uh, commander in chief of the Continental Army. And it was discharge discharge papers for captain of the Connecticut line. Mm. That was pretty cool. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I had uh, Stonewall, a button from Stonewall Jackson's uniform with a little bit of the gray still attached to it oh, and neat. blood on it. Oh, but not from it's been taken slicker. off his uniform, giving it to I don't know one of the staff guys or something, and then ended up in Guilford Courthouse, Virginia, for the rest of its life uh, with this one family that had it framed in a cheap little frame. Huh? Yeah. What'd you um, do with it? I had I sold it. Huh? Um, I had. I think. What about the map? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I'm getting to that. But I also had I I had on um, official stationery of the Army of Northern Virginia. That was pretty cool because it was actually stationery. And it had Robert E. Lee signed in the middle, and then it had his entire staff, including you, Bo. Oh. Including you. Oh. Yeah. Oh. It had all the entire staff. Engineers, um wow. chief of staff, you know, um, um is a, a different engineers a, the head surgeon, the um, <clears throat> uh, commissary commander, the quartermaster, the it just it had everybody, everybody on there in a big circle around his name, which was pretty cool. And it was, and it was um, Fredericksburg, December or something, eighteen sixty-two. Oh, cool. Yeah, and then and then the, the primo thing I thought I, they all were, but but was uh, a map made by. Um, 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 AP Hill? No, no, no. Uh, uh, oh, Hotchkiss? Yes, by Hotchkiss uh, of Chancellorsville, which is one of the most confusing yeah. battles. You need a map. Yeah. I mean, you really have to have an overhead map to see what's going on there. And and um, and it, it was yeah done by him. And it was, of course, he would do a preliminary and then he would color in everything. And so it had all the different, you know, mm-hmm. elevations and colors and some of them and well done. And it ended up in the um, um, headquarters, uh, whatever, en- of engineers or whatever for the Confederate Army in Richmond. When Richmond fell, a company of Connecticut soldiers grabbed it. They were supposed to turn it into their engineers, you know, 
Uh-huh. Would, have, would have eventually ended up in the Smithsonian, I think. And it ended up framed and had slight, slight water damage on the margin because it was in a frame, just a regular frame, on a wall in Stratford, Connecticut, I think, hmm. in a Grand Army of the Republic Hall hmm. after the war. Hmm. And that was supposed to be turned into the to the Union engineers. <laughs> You know, mm. somebody was disobeying orders. Yeah, <laughs> it happens. Yeah, so, most of those are all, I think, in the Smithsonian, I think. Now. Yeah. So whatever happened to that map? I remember when you bought it. I remember. Uh, and I bet I never remember. I, I knew that when you moved and everything, you got rid of a lot of your stuff. But what happened to the map? It sold it. Oh, you did sell it? Okay. Yeah. So, you, so you have none of this stuff left. All of it. Nothing. Just, you got rid of it all. Uh, do you miss it? <laughs> um, eh, a little bit. You know, yeah. I I don't know. You know, but it's like I go, where would it be right now? It'd right. be in that storage unit down mm. down the fifteen minutes from here. It's yeah. like there's no room. Yeah, there's no room for this stuff. You know, no. it's like it's cool uh, that you I had like, it. I, at I, once. I, like my mom lived in 97 and I saw her life just not that she ever had a lot, but I saw it just reduced to a tiny little room and yeah. room a nursing home. She shared with another woman, you know, huh. and I looked in her closet and there was like a couple of little pairs of shoes, all comfortable shoes. And, and then like, I don't know, four, four little outfits. And that's what it comes to yeah. if you live too long. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. You sit around and you sit around and you think, okay, like I've the told Laura go, I said these two rings, this one was your your uncle's and this one was your dad's. I said, coincidentally interesting enough, both were given to me on our wedding day. Hmm. One was her mom, my mother in law, and the other one was my brother in law. He ended up having a ring. He didn't know she did that that Nona had given it to me in the morning. And here it was after the ceremony, and he said, "Tom, come here. I want you. This this used to be Uncle Sir, Zio Sergio's ring." And I, I'm like, "God, Frank, that's incredible!" Because I'm like, I, this one, look, this is this is Roberto's ring. He goes, "Oh, really? Yeah, Nona gave it to me this morning." <laughs> anyway, <laughs> those two go when I'm gone. Those go to my stepdaughter because that is her grandfather and step right. and her and her great uncle. Yeah. Um, you know, and then I go, this goes to my daughter, this go, these go to my son. You know, I mean, you, you start doing that, you just parceling it out. Yeah. Well, this uh has been quite an honor for me um to have you come on here and do this, Tom. Um I really Thanks, appreciate man. it. I I appreciate the time you've given me in the last week on the phone talking about all this. Feel free to give me a, t- a call anytime you want to shoot the shit, Tom. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was very enjoyable. Uh, very I enjoyed interesting. it too, man. Oh, good, thank you. good. good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you to all of the uh, patrons, and actually, not just patrons, but all the all the people that sent in questions. We didn't get to all of them. There were there were like I probably had like sixty to eighty of them, and a lot of them uh, were redundant and and stuff. And so we mm-hmm. tried to ask. Uh, ask you know a representative question of all the ones that came in um yeah so that's about it uh tom and you know you got to come up and uh paint the town with uh bo and i one night we we really get wild oh uh, um, yeah oh yeah it'd be fun mm-hmm. <laughs> we go to the barnsworth house and down to that colonial bar yeah at the, at the dobbins house yeah that's basically like, where that's we go true. so how, how long are you gonna yeah. be how long will you be in italy when you leave in march do you know how how what how, how long, long are you going to be? You're going to be back the summer or? Uh, we, well, we plan on three weeks. Oh, okay, good, good. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we plan on three weeks. Um, and we'll see. I I'm, I'm like kind of nervous. I don't want to get quarantined somewhere for two weeks. And mm. uh, you know what, what I mean? Nightmare. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. you just don't know. I'm, I mean, and those things change. You know, the European Union changes, and then oh, it's yeah. okay. Now. Oh no, it's not okay. Yeah. Oh my God, yeah, so on and so forth. England is different than the other ones because they get different strain, and you know, it's just, why don't you well, just stay home and listen to Dean Martin for three weeks? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, well, uh, yeah. Well, no, yeah. So, well, I'll, uh, you know, 
I'll check in with you at some point. All right, Bo. Yep. Mm-hmm. And uh, for those of you at home, uh, you go on Amazon Prime, check out the Battle of the Bulge. There's a three part, uh, three is a three part series, or it's just three separate movies, right? No, no, it's like three separate independent movies. Yeah, and and um, <clears throat> and the third one is not done yet. Okay. Oh, that's yeah. why I couldn't find it. Okay, so right now we have Wonderland and uh, Winter War that are available on uh, Amazon Prime. Yeah. And uh, uh, a personal recommendation is a movie called Supervised, which cracked me up. Um, it's, about, <laughs> it's about retired uh, superheroes, um, and there's uh, some conspiracy afoot at the uh, retirement home. And uh, yeah. it uh, it gave me a couple of legitimate belly laughs. So uh, that's also on Amazon Prime. Sure. Uh, you could uh, Tom Barringer online is Tom's website. And uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Bo, for putting Bye, this man. together. Bye, Eric. Bye, Bo. See you Talk later, to you Tom. Later. We'll see Talk you later, all right, guys. Bud. All right. Thanks, yeah, everybody. Enjoyed it. All right. Enjoyed it. Bye-bye. God bless. All right. All right. You too. That was great. Thank you very much, Tom. I really appreciate this. Oh, he left. <laughs> He's done. Right. Well, that was fun, guys. Ah, yeah, that was. Thank you very much, Bo. Hey, no worries, mate. All right, next.